session. So can we have an open session roll call? President Bachman? Here. Director Bruce? Here. Director Hayes? Here. Director Ratcliffe? Here. Um, here. Uh, <clears throat> is no reportable action from closed session. So do we have any additions or deletions to the open session agenda? Staff has none. Okay. Um, and no directors do I uh, see anybody uh, saying anything? So I'm sorry, uh, this is uh, not a public... Uh, it's an agenda item? Um, no, I'm not for uh, additions and deletions to the open session agenda. It isn't. So we're going to move on to oral communications at this point. Would anybody like to uh, comment on any of the thing that is applicable to the district in oral communications? Ms. Lowen. Yes, Deborah Lowen. I uh, wrote to the chair and the general manager and to the attorney to say that regarding the agenda item on the LADOC appointment, there's a Facebook page that says there are two vacancies and they will be selected in this August meeting. And it was posted on the website in a very hidden place and it was posted in the newspaper conflicting. After the end of the uh, August 8th deadline for receipt of applications, the district website changed their notice to say that there will be one appointment tonight and two in September. And I protest that. There are actually three vacancies on this committee, and I think the board has a duty to fill those as soon as possible. You have two applications, you have two qualified candidates, therefore, my point was, since you advertise for two openings and you receive two, you have two vacancies and you receive two applications, that that should proceed tonight. And I wanted that as an addition to the agenda, and I see that you have chosen not to do that. But I'm making my point that it should be when that agenda comes up, I expect that will be done. Um, there's a very limited set of circumstances in which some, in a <coughs> addition can be done to the agenda and none of those qualifications uh, pertain. They're related to uh, matters of emergency or matters that came up between the time the agenda went out and the time of the meeting. So um, any clarification from council to whether there is any criteria uh, regarding I am, this? I am not aware of any legal criteria that would allow the item to be modified at this point to reflect two appointments to the agenda. Okay. So the circumstances of this uh, item that will have a format will be addressed at the time it comes up on tonight's agenda. So, anybody else like to speak on oral communications? Um, hi, I'm Tony Norton and I'm a member of the LADOC committee. I did a little bit of research on the MADI Act and that also pertains to assigning um, uh, um, people to the uh, committee when, when there's vacancies. Now, is that something that I can, um, should I discuss that now, or should I address that when we get to the, the item you're filling, those, whether or not you're going to fill those vacancies? I agree. Okay. Yeah, it would be more appropriate yeah, for, for the, the specific agenda item. Okay. Okay. Would anybody else like to comment on anything mm -hmm. um, not on tonight's agenda during our open Okay, I see no one raising their hand, so we'll close out oral communications and we will um, move on to unfinished business. So the first item on that is the project list for the United States Department of Agriculture loan application. So I'll allow staff to bring this up. All right, give me a second. We have a small presentation regarding this. And tonight is a milestone for the application process because we are seeking board resolution to actually submit the application. Um, we have representatives of WSC here tonight to provide the presentation as soon as my computer decides it's a good idea to do so. There we go. And at the end of the discussion, or at the end of the presentation, I um, want to go over some proposed changes to the resolution so that the board has full clarity before the discussion happens but I'll turn it over to Kirsten first. So the um, presentation that we're having tonight is a public information item 
as part of the USDA application process, we wanted to be clear and transparent about which projects were going in. Um, when we started this process, and I'll talk a little bit more, we had a very long and lengthy pro uh, project list, and we have narrowed it down to six projects, and there's very good reason for that. So um, this, the purpose of this is just to go through the six projects that are actually in the application package that we're going to submit. So if you the next slide for me. So the purpose of this, again, is just to present the final list of projects. And then at the end, um, we will accept public comments that are related to any of the projects and make note of them. So for those of you who haven't been at a meeting or through this whole process, I wanted to very high level go through how we kind of got here. So the district started looking at funding about a year ago. Um, WSC was hired in an as-needed um, basis just to take a look, and we looked at state revolving fund loans, we looked at Prop 1 loans, we looked at grants, and at the end of the day, what really made sense for the district was USDA loans. The big driver for that is that they do 40-year loans at a very low interest, and most of the district is in the eligible area, so it worked very well, and that was in conjunction with staff and the board at the time. So we decided to pursue USDA loans, and then we have, um, a very long list of, I, of projects that we looked at based on the district CIP. From that, um, we had kind of a target goal of what we were looking at to spend, so we narrowed that down to that. And then, um, these two things, I have two bullets on here, but two things happened kind of all at once. One was USDA said, we have way more money to give out this year than we thought we were going to have. Can you guys please get your application in, in this fiscal year? So then we kind of had to look and say, okay, how many projects can we get done, and how many can we get environmentally permitted in this amount of time? So that was the driver on which projects kind of stayed on the list and which ones got dropped off the list, because if they were environmentally complex, we just didn't have the time to get all the environmental done for this round of USDA funding. So because of the environmental um, issues, that led to very quickly hiring an environmental consultant to get through the NEPA process, which is what's, what is required from USDA. CEQA still has to happen, but as far as the application goes, we just need to have NEPA by the time we actually submit the application. CEQA needs to be done by the time we get construction. So they have been working fast and furious, and they actually have made all their deadlines. So right now, where we're at with environmental is we just have a couple of regulatory agencies, pardon my voice here, um, a couple of regulatory agencies are doing some review, but we expect that to be back in a week, and then the environmental portion of NEPA will be complete. In parallel, WSC has compiled the preliminary engineering report, which is, if you were here at the December meeting, I passed around a very thick report that described all the projects in depth. Um, it's, a, it's a very important portion. It's most of the application that actually needs to go in, so it's a pre-design report for all of the projects. And so then during all that time as well, the district has been working on finances, figuring out what's actually reasonable for the district. We've had communication with the board. And so all of these have come together for the application package, which is where we're at. So once we get board authorization to submit the application, that does not actually um, require the district to take the loan. All it does is give permission to submit an application. So then we're going to finalize everything and submit. And right now, Adam is going to take over and just discuss these six projects that are in our application process. All right, so as Kirsten said, I'm just going to highlight the projects that we have in the preliminary design report. The first is swim tank. So currently, the district has two 20,000-gallon uh, redwood reservoirs that are uh, basically leaking, and so we're trying to get in there to reduce water loss, and so we're going to upgrade the tank to a larger size, 62,000 gallons, um, be a bolted steel tank that will uh, reduce water loss and just uh, increase operational capacity in that area. Then we have five pipeline projects. So the first is this Hine Road pipeline. So we're going to install a six-inch pipe there and abandon an existing pipeline that runs through an environmentally sensitive area, which is uh, difficult to maintain. And with this, we're going to be able to improve water pressure to uh, the customers in the area, as well as uh, meet the fire flow requirements. <coughs> Our third one here is the 
or the big one here is the Lion Zone pipeline. And so this is a pipeline, uh, it's currently six inches, so we're gonna replace that with a 12 inch main, allowing for much greater capacity in that area. And with the greater capacity, it's gonna give us more, give the district more uh, operational flexibility, so they'll be able to transport water between different reservoirs and help them on their operations side. Additionally, oops, sorry. Uh, additionally, there's a portion of the pipeline that goes through homeowners' yards, making it difficult to access, and so we're moving the pipeline into the right-of-way in the street area, uh, which should eliminate that problem. Uh, next, we have the Sequoia pipeline. So in this area, we're just upsizing uh, the size of the pipe from a 6-inch to an 8-inch main, which is going to allow for uh, increased fire flow requirements and uh, reduce production of water loss due to leaks in that pipeline. And then we have the hillside drive pipeline. So again, we're upsizing the pipe from a six inch to a four inch, or from a four inch to a six inch pipe, and updating the infrastructure associated with that, so pressure reducing valves and all pertinences. Uh, in this particular area, the soil conditions um, are a little unstable, which has caused some issues with the existing pipe from movement. So we're going to be addressing that. We're increasing capacity in the area, and it's going to allow the district to meet fire flow. And then last, we have the California pipeline. And here, we current, the district currently has a two-inch main, so we're just going to be increasing the capacity and uh, replace it with a six-inch pipe, which is going to allow for fire flow, um, reducing water loss from any leaks. And then we're also going to protect sensitive habitats, so the existing main uh, again, runs through someone's yard and then crosses the creek, and so we're moving this into the street area to eliminate that problem. So that's the end of our presentation as far as the projects on the list. And so if anyone has any project related comments, we're happy to address them. Adam, do you mind just taking notes for me? Thank you. Uh, well, you okay. didn't summarize the cost. What's the bottom line cost? So the final cost for projects actually have them. That's well, a key point to understand there, really. It um, is. Um, could, could you ask uh, let us, the directors, um, yeah. comment person, and I'll go sure. to the public very quickly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, bear that's mind, a good thing. This okay. is a, a, for the loan. It's not, you know, this, there, they, in fact, the money from this loan doesn't come until the projects are all completed. So the, the actual money to come, wait, well, and Brian wants to come, I'm sorry. Well, I, I, I just kind of want to jump in there because the resolution in the board packet is asking for authorization to submit a loan package loan for $8.5 million. Yeah. That was developed last week, and that is on the sweet side of things. I think the actual project cost is on the order of 8.2. Yeah, it's just under 8.3. 8.3? Yeah. If you add up all the projects. But Kirsten contacted me this week earlier this week and said, hey, would you like us to include the, the um, interest payments on the bridge loan in the loan application package? So to make sure everybody understands that, we get the USDA money at the end of the construction projects. We'll get a big check for everything. We are going to take out a loan during construction to pay for these, and that loan is going to be at a higher interest rate, and it's going to be a construction loan or a bridge loan. We are going to have to pay interest on that loan. That is interest out the door while we're paying on that loan. We can include that interest in the USDA loan. So because our main issue is cash flow, staff is recommending that that interest be included in the loan and spread that out over 40 years. Yes, it's spreading it out money that we've already paid, but it immediately gives us that cash back. We are estimating through WSC and, and staff, we've worked out the numbers and we are estimating that it's going to be close to a million dollars. It's a fat number, but we want to make sure we're covered in tonight's resolution so that we have the ability to be flexible. The actual agreement's going to come back to you and that's going to be a firm number. For tonight's resolution, staff is requesting that the board consider a change of 8.5 to 9.4 million dollars. That includes the interest for the bridge loan or the, constru or the construction loan, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, I just want to say I think what we're trying to do is uh, leverage uh, an increased revenue stream into getting a lot of work started. 
And I think that's a good thing to do. It's been a long time getting these projects started. So what we can do to accelerate this is good. And getting and what you're talking about doing, um, getting another uh, loan on the interest, I think is good because it will help us follow the next step. Okay. So it's going to be a while before we have enough uh, money that's come in from all of the, the revenue changes to actually to pay for everything. And it's going to take loans in the um, intervening time to get this done. And, and this technique is a lot like transferring a high balance credit card to a low balance credit card. You're still paying the credit card, but it's at a, at a better rate. I'm really interested in the fact that so many of these projects, actually all of these projects, support improved fire flow and, and better infrastructure for us to be able to serve our customers um, in the <coughs> uh, unfortunate event that there might be a fire emergency. So I'm, that, that's a super high priority for me. Yeah. Anybody? Oh. Yeah, I mean, well, okay. I, I hadn't heard about the interest part of this, and I, I'm kind of philosophically opposed to paying interest on interest, if we can avoid it. If, how much would it be, do you think? It'd be about $900,000 is our initial estimate that we were able to put together this For week. the interest on the bridge loans up to the point of inception of the ADA <coughs> loan? That's our Which rough is estimate maybe for a that four or five year portion of the time. time. And that's, the key component of this that's missing is Stephanie Hill. She yeah. was unavailable this week, and so you have two engineers trying to figure this out. And she's going to have to buy off on this before we actually submit the application package. Okay. And so that, that's one of the reasons why we're asking for a little, a little richness in the numbers tonight so that we have flexibility we don't have to come back to you. <coughs> Stephanie is going to authorize this and bless this before it actually goes in. Okay. I mean, the whole, you're absolutely right. The whole purpose of this is cash flow. And I, I, I'm, I am kind of philosophically opposed, and I think Stephanie would be yep. too, to paying interest on interest. And I think we could afford, because we're talking over, what, a four or five year span here? Roughly. Yeah. So paying a couple hundred thousand dollars a year interest to avoid financing interest in five years should be affordable to me. And okay. we don't need to add another million dollars to this, I don't think. That would be, be my... And I'd, be I'd just like to clarify, clarify, this is an upper limit, but if <laughs> Stephanie comes in and, yeah. and disagrees with <laughs> the numbers, or it, it wouldn't be a requirement, is that... Correct. We go with the number Stephanie blesses. Okay. Bottom line. I'm, I'm not submitting anything that Stephanie is not okay. Uh, let's go. Um, <laughs> you know me. Uh, I'm not going to vote against anything. You know, okay, I'm not a big finance expert, but I'm not going to vote in, against anything that's going to stop forward. moving forward <laughs> on yeah. on this. So. Yeah. And before we go to the public, one one more thing that I think is really Good about this is the uh, upsizing of the lion pipe because we're going to be involved in groundwater management in the near future, and that um, the lion tank is one of the, I mean, is the biggest tank, okay, our biggest reservoir, and something that can help us move water in the direction of our south system or something that we need to do conjunctive use for. I think is a is a very good thing to get done, and that. Uh, and as I understand, that pipe is in pretty bad shape. Okay. Oh, and in fact, Director Bruce's comment, that will affect every customer of the district for fire flow, um, disaster reliability. It's, it's greatly undersized. And it's been a restriction in this district for a long time. So that project there will affect every customer of the district. It's a great project. Rick, these six projects, are they the highest priority CIP projects, or are they amongst the highest priority? Amongst the highest priority, some were kind of slotted because they were the right price too, but they are all high priority. They are all either leakage or flow restrictions, like the Lion, California Drive, staff's down there fixing leaks all the time. It's a very high groundwater, and you go back in time, that's a class one area in wastewater, high levels of wastewater, so it's a water quality issue as well. Um, the, uh, Hillside or North Boulder Creek, ground movement, we're there all the time uh, fixing leaks because it's a PVC main. There are high maintenance or flow restrictions. Yes. Okay. We have plenty more, but these were one step. And I understand that, that we have to have the environmental sort of step in place before USD will look at these. So these were also ones that were achievable. They weren't some of the more sensitive, more complex projects, but they're still high priorities. So. Yeah. This was to get into this 
year of ready availability of money. The perfect example for that would be the Fall Creek Fish Letter, the, the permigatory project that we have, what, seven or eight permits that we were trying to achieve for that. Um, there was no way we would have met the deadline for the application process. <coughs> No other director comments. Um, we'll go to the public now. Um, anybody want to comment? Mr. Cooper. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when you started this process about a year ago, it was, was it six projects at that time? And I think the cost was $5 million loan. Now it's $9.4 million. I would like to have a detailed explanation of why it's costing more for the same projects. I would like to have a detailed explanation of what materials being used and is this above ground or below ground? What's it replacing? So first of all, why is it almost double the cost? I, I understand the interest. I don't really approve of that way of doing the interest, but I think we've been kept uh, this thing has grown out of proportion. What's it going to do to our ambitious capital improvement plan that's been planned for the next three years? It's supposed to do 15 million. Is that supposed to? Is that going to turn into 100 million? Have you projected all those costs? And why such detail? I mean, let's say lack of detail until this point, and the increase in cost is out of proportion. Why would you submit a $5 million in projects and have them off and not have them current estimates on what the cost would be? You mean you did the cost after you submitted them and they were estimated many years ago? Why? What it was the process? Please explain. Thank you. Um, why don't I get other public comments? <laughs> and uh, Yours will be memorable and we'll come back to it when we uh, Get more public comments. Then uh, uh, Norton. Um, I I just have a concern about. Um, I'm always very reluctant to accept a proposal that's given to me at the last minute. That's adding in the almost million dollar for the bridge loan. That's something that um, I would really be cautious about. And why doesn't that have to be decided tonight? And um, maybe. Um, Director um, Lee suggested that it would be easier for you so they wouldn't have to come back to you, but I think it should come back to you. I don't think that it should go to Stephanie saying that you all approved it. I think that, um, that it, she should be, it should be discussed with Stephanie before you entertain that additional loan. That's my opinion. Mr. Foltz. Uh, Bob Foltz, Boulder Creek. <clears throat> What's the annual payment going to be once all projects are completed and we get the entire 8.5 million? Um, here's one. You got a point of yes, <coughs> want to comments first. Okay. Comments? Okay, we'll come back. Um, well, yeah, I, I want to be you. I, I, I want to be uniform in how I do this. So okay. since I've started the process of okay, uh, so but we're writing the questions down so we can uh, yes okay um, and you wanted to know what the uh, yeah, what's the, the annual payments okay yeah because I think what it does is it also uh, directs us to understanding a little bit better about what the debt load is going to be for the district and how much additional capacity is or isn't going to be there relative to the rest of the <coughs> projects that are on the table. Um, it would seem, given the 60% or so increase in costs here, very, it seems to be happening just very quickly, <coughs> that the rest of those projects, if they were calculated using numbers that were estimated a while ago, that those numbers may need to change as well. Um, I know the projects haven't really changed over the last 15 or 20 years, but the, the numbers probably need to over that period of time. So I, I think that also needs to be part of the discussion uh, relative to making sure that the district is not getting into any kind of a financial, um, uh, an unstable financial situation. Thank you. Hey Bob, I can give you an estimate, like quarter million a year, um, something like that. Okay, um, Ms. Wollin. Yeah. 
Deborah Lowen. So I did kind of the same thing Bob and Ed have done, of looking over the history of it and how it's increased. And one of the, <coughs> everybody agrees these projects need to be done. There isn't any emotional factor about fire protection. This is all practical things. This is what the district's job is to do. Supply water for water protection and for domestic water. But I've, I've asked this in finance committee meetings about, and I, I agree with Bob, we really need to know what debt load we're taking on. And I've asked Stephanie if she was prepared to budget for the board that would project if we got $5 million loan at that time. How is that going to look at how is that going to affect us for the next three to five <coughs> years? How is it going to affect every budget and our ability to, to do other jobs? There are a lot more important jobs to do, too, not just this set of seven. Six. And six or seven, whatever. We also don't know how much of a bridge loan you're going to get. Is it a three million? Is it a seven million? We don't know how much that is. What's the term on that? What's the interest rate? Actually, I don't even know what the USDA loan interest rate is. I believe it's a 40-year loan. Sometimes they're 30 years, but I think that I've read 40 years, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're talking about indebtedness that's going to go on a long time here. I think we need a lot more budget analysis, and I agree with Bob. This is going to be a big burden for the district, and until we have that, I don't see how the board can really approve going ahead, and I know you haven't approved that yet. That's going to be coming up. But those projections are just as important as identifying and prioritizing these jobs. Because in five years, are we going to be totally in the hole? My other concern is in 2016, you hired a consultant in BS to, to prepare for your rate study, to look at the whole district and do staffing studies and, and needs studies and all that. <coughs> it prepared a whole set of ranges of rate increases for you to take, I mean, color brochures, 11 pages double-sided, a lot of work went into it, and they emphasized when they presented this that this is all based on the district not taking on any new debt, because the purpose of it was to get financially healthy and to have healthy reserves so that you could go out and apply for loans at a good rate. So that was a year ago. I mean, I mean, the first rate increase step up is coming in October, so it hasn't been that long. And I'm also concerned about that because you pay a lot of money for a consultant and they did a lot of work and massive studies of what the district's needs are and the district's financial condition, and now you're kind of stepping past that. And those are my concerns. <coughs> okay, anybody else? Mr. Holloway. Uh, thanks. I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, I just want to remind the board that back in uh, 2015, the first year when uh, Brian Lee was here, um, he he uh, recommended to the board that you postpone work on the Fall Creek Fish Ladder. Um, so the debris removal that is happening, that's getting approved uh, right around now, is, is only the, the maintenance since 2015. But actually in 2015, there was a major project of, uh, you know, to reconstruct the fish ladder in, uh, on Fall Creek. And this was a project that the district took on when it bought the system from cal -Am back in 2008. So it's been 10 year project and in 2015 the recommendation from staff was let's put it off and so now all you have to do is the uh, the little bit of debris removal uh, which is not the whole project so there is a whole project we're in the we're, we're on the hook for a whole project here whenever we bought the system from Calam this was what was in our future and um, and so this board and this district manager have avoided this. They've avoided this. They've pushed it off into the future. And now we've got a mega million dollar uh, loan application because we don't, just don't have the money to do anything here. So um, just want to remind you 
that you made this decision more than three years ago. This was the budget time in 2015, so it was around June of 2015, more than three years ago, you made the decision, let's put it off, let's put off the fish ladder, let's do something else. Uh, in fact, what else was there worth to, to, to do? Uh, everybody knows it's the Terry Vieira lawsuit, so that's where you put your money. Good luck. <laughs> Any other public comment? <coughs> I don't see any okay, other public comment. Um, so we're right back to the board and to um, staff. So um, do you want to pick anything from that? Or I mean, um, original project list, um, any? Um, We've been bringing information to the board on a semi-regular basis regarding the project list and the cost estimates for this project um, as Late as June, in the admin engineer admin engineering update, we provided a fresh and cost estimate for these projects that showed at about you know, 7.2, I think it was, for the latest numbers like that. Um, given the construction environment that we're in right now, I don't think it's surprising that numbers are escalating upwards. Um, how it doubled? We were dealing with project numbers, cost cost estimate numbers probably dating back to close to 2006 or 2008. I've been very clear with those numbers that they are not fresh all through this process, that we actually have projects on the books and are willing to spend the time to take those projects forward. It was important that we develop an engineer's opinion of probable construction costs, which is exactly what we did and exactly what we said we were going to do. So it's not surprising that the numbers have escalated extremely hard. It's, it's unfortunate, but it's reality. And I mean, I, I flippantly say that there isn't a back home in California right now that isn't busy, and that's the bottom line. And we saw that last year when we tried to bid the swim tank, and it came out three times more than the engineer's estimate. So that is the reality of the world we're dealing with. It's unfortunate, but that is the way it is. The financial costs about putting a, a loan out there um, are rate increases that we implemented last year were developed to give us about two and a half to three million dollars a year in capital replacement costs. This loan would be based on what Director Hayes has provided, about a quarter of a million dollars in interest or in payment per year. Um, I'm on the order of thinking it'd be a bit closer to four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year, but half a million dollars, leaving us two and a half, two to two and a half million dollars a year for other capital projects, which is perfectly acceptable. That's, that's something that we built into the equation and we've always dealt with. And the idea that we never anticipated taking on debt during the rate study is patently false. I mean, that was always discussed about how much effort we could and what our rate and debt ratios are gonna be was always a discussion that was gonna be there. And we had every intention and we've been very public about the fact that we need to borrow money because we are cash poor right now to kickstart the CIP program. So I think it's very important that everybody understand that we've always intended to borrow money. Um, that was that was intended to get this process going and these projects going. If it's if it's unpalatable now, okay, I you know I, this is information that we could have used six, nine, ten months ago. The changing of the numbers, I agree. We're trying to get the board tonight to approve authorization to submit an application. This is doing nothing more than authorizing staff to submit the application. The actual application will come back for board approval, assuming USDA accepts it. We're hopeful. We are under a time crunch. This application has to go in within the next two weeks. So that's why you know, we're rapidly trying to get this to resolution fast so we can actually move on this and give you the flexibility to make the decision later on. So the decision tonight is just we're, we're going to make this decision so that we can be, make a firmer decision later on. Now, whatever information you need between now and then, we can produce and provide to give you the confidence that this is the correct path to take at the time you actually approve the loan or approve, approve the USDA, USDA contract, which will come, come to you sometime in the fall, I'm guessing. The concept about the Fall Creek Fish Ladder um, is absolutely absurd. We've been trying to get that fish ladder built for years, and we've been working hard to do that. We've had the permitting agencies who make multiple changes throughout the years, and we've kept the board fully informed on that. We were not prepared in 2015 to go forward because we lacked the permits. We had the permits pulled out underneath us from the last minute in 2016 and 2017, 
and we are trying to get those permits done so we can actually make the repairs. Uh, moving forward without actually having the legal requirements to move forward, I don't recommend. I think that is a very unwise decision, and I am a little hesitant to support anybody that wants to move forward in that regard. I think I've hit most of the questions. Adam, if I haven't, you could kind of refresh me on some of the issues that were raised, if I've missed anything major. Just the project list, so that inconsistent throughout. I think that was some of the questions. And it, and it has been inconsistent. It's been constantly flexing project lists. We've been very flexible in making sure the projects that are accurate, appropriate, and we can actually get accomplished. We started with a list. It's changed. We've kept you updated through the whole process. And it's been restricted by what we um, had available for projects to do that had um, doable environmental permitting, okay, with a, a large portion of that. Correct. So, um, uh, well, again, I'm not a you know financial finan financial guy, but you know I do know that mo you know money is what greases the skin <laughs> so, and to get things done. But I do think uh, on a couple of points that were made, you know we we were talking about really putting all the information on each project onto the website and including financial uh, uh, information, you know, and then I think that, I really think that we have to do that. And the other thing I'd like to say is I really, because I'm not a financial guy, and this is why we have meetings with, because I can tell there's two or three people out there that make some really good comments about financing, and I, I just know that it's a brainstorming thing. You know, I, I'm all ears if we can save some money somewhere. I do think that this district you know, I'm thinking 20, you know, next year we knew, do need to step up to the plate of, you know, other avenues, grants, what have you. There was that one, that, that seminar um, that I went to with Gene about um, the put in meters. There's the grants available for installing. I know we installed them in Lompico, but we could possibly apply. You know, I, I think we, we need to look, take a look at um, so, um, you know, grants and other, you know, low and more low interest loans, etc. Financing. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, oral comments. No, no. Um, were you going to answer? No. Were you going to answer the questions? Um, my question hasn't been answered yet. Restate your question. The question was, what is cash flow? My basic question: What is the annual interest cost once all the projects are completed? Mm -hmm. And I think I heard 250, but I did a quick calculation. That seems too low. It is too low. And then I think yeah. I heard 500, but I, I don't know which one of them is actually accurate, or if we if we have an accurate number right now. Yeah. Um, do you want interest cost, or you want the total payment? I'm sorry. Interest cost or the total payment, the, the, principal and interest. So I'm assuming that when we get the 40-year mm -hmm. loan, that it's going to yeah. be an interest and principal over Correct. some period of time. Yep. 40 years. What? Could be 30. Whatever. Yeah. What is the total payment that we start making as soon as the construction is done and we actually get the money? So it would be on a, just a standard amortization, $453,156. Is that principal and interest? Is that the number that... Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was, so I when Stephanie comes, did an amortization. When Stephanie comes back, so. we'll be able to get that number yeah. confirmed. Is that what right. you're saying? I believe so. Okay. Um, and here's the 2.5% interest. You're right. Yeah. Or, you know, so two. nothing is locked in until USDA actually confirms it. So I, his number is close to what we have estimated <coughs> as yeah. well, very close, like within a dollar or two. Yeah, yeah, However, yeah, yeah. it will depend on how much is actually yeah. borrowed to give you the final number. I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. Well, so if you decide to, um, hypothetically, if you decided to borrow 8.5 million versus 9.4, you'll be paying interest on a larger amount because that difference is what you, the interest you would pay on the bridge loan. So which was sure. the number, John, that you did? 8.5? Okay, I, I did 8.4. Thank you. So, You're welcome. Okay. Um, so we don't have, the answer to your question is we do not have a solid number yet. Yeah. You will have a solid number when the board actually approves the loan which we're waiting on information from USDA. So yes, it includes Stephanie. It also includes, we need numbers back from USDA. Great, thank you. Do you have any idea what the interest would be? Yeah. Okay. Um, Margaret, I believe you have, okay. 
I was just going to suggest that we bring the discussion back okay. to the dais <laughs> and, and not have chatter in the, in the house so everyone can participate. Okay. Um, like well, I just had a couple of comments based on public. Uh, particularly one about taking on um, debt because that was integral to the whole rate setting process because nobody's going to lend you money if you don't have the income to support the repayments. That was fundamental to having a, a viable rate structure. <coughs> so we knew we'd be going to be taking out loans for capital projects because um, we would suddenly have somebody to show the bankers that say we're good, we're good for the repayments. So that's the whole idea between the, the loans for projects. And this is just a different variety. There's a, there's a construction loan, and then there's the sort of mortgage at the end, which would be the USDA one. That's the way I see it. Um, and, um, and I just want to make a, a sort of follow-up comment to Rick's comment about the, the Lion project. Um, that's one, again, we went through the whole capital uh, planning process starting in the workshops in 2015, and not everything that was highest priority got on this list because the permitting issues didn't meet the timeline. But I think that is an example of something that's benefits everybody in the district. And it fit into the permitting schedule. And um, so I think <coughs> the availability of money this year gave us an opportunity to sort of jumpstart a few of these projects. Um, it may not match exactly that priority matrix that we worked on in the CIP workshops, but I think this is practical. It gets things, a lot of important things done early. And just to remind um, the other directors that this, it's a on staff report, it does not obligate funds. It just opens the door to make it possible. So I want to hear back from Stephanie, and of course we're going to have exact numbers when we actually talk about the loan. But this is the direction. the direction to go to make it possible. And then Stephanie will be available to us to give us more specific information. And then I guess they have like the rate lock in from USDA, just again, like with the more. So I think this is a no-brainer. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a backstop. It's something that would kick in five years from now if we need to use it. If that's the smartest thing to do, you know, at the time, we'd have it available to us. We'd have 40 years of financing a credit facility, basically, to <coughs> effectively refinance the projects that we're going to do between now and then. So it's important to point out, the po actual projects are going to be financed by bridge loans, not this package, but bridge loans that Stephanie and staff are diligently working on that are a different interest rate and have different interest costs and that kind of thing. And the, the only thing I would be opposed to is just is taking, assuming we're going to take the interest from these bridge loans and, and pay interest on interest. <coughs> because, I mean, you know, anyone who has a mortgage knows that once you add the interest cost onto your mortgage and that cost of the house, man, you look at the total and it's unbelievable how much you're paying. And if, if we were to do $8.4 million into this facility for 40 years, even at a great interest rate, it's almost $20 million we're actually paying back over that whole period of time. And if there's a way to do it better and cheaper and save money, but we, we have five years to figure that out. This is our backstop, and this is a no-brainer, and we need to act on this now to get this. We don't we can't slip this into next month. We can't study it anymore. We gotta do it in August, right? We gotta we do keep this. Process going. Yeah. So I think we should go ahead. And it doesn't I mean Five hundred thousand. We uh, we're not threatening our ability to build reserves in any way by doing this. It strengthens our ability to do the reserves. We we get projects moving, construction moving, right, and it leaves it leaves money on the table that we can actually start building reserves with, right. and it leaves money on the table to do other projects outside of these lists. Right. <coughs> so, um, any other board? Comment on this? Um, then would I? I would move approval of resolution number four, 18 19, as written with the change to a top bound of 9.4 million in the one, two, three, four, five, sixth whereas. There's three places. There is, I can three, pla three places. In the three places noted, where 8.5 should be replaced with 9.4. Okay. Do I hear a second? For second. Okay. Um, could we have a vote? Okay. Roll call. Director, uh, Director Smallman? Aye. Director Hayes? Aye. 
Yes. Very well. Um, I'm happy to see uh, this district seriously addressing capital uh, It's been a long time coming. Okay. Um, let's move on to the second item of the unfinished <coughs> the 2017-18 grand jury response and ad hoc committee. Um, any um, you got an issue? You're on my foot. You got an issue? You're on my foot. I'm not. You got an issue? Um, <laughs> call the sheriff. Let's okay. yes. Let's take a recess here <laughs> for five minutes and hopefully We're the grand jury, I believe, and um, and then the a copy of the actual. Uh, Ranger report. Um, yes. So, any, I'll look to council in case I missed something in that process. Um, so, I think this is not a, you know, a big discussion point for the board at this point. And, and then the second, okay, component of this is that we're considering whether to extend the ad hoc committee that was composed of myself and John Hayes that uh, worked in order to develop this response. And there's a, I believe it would be a good idea for the two of us to remain as a committee so that we can work with um, LADOC and the district and work through the implementation of this in the early phases of this and get to um, you know, the six month okay, time frame that we've uh, set as the limit on much of this and get it in good shape before uh, and we can allow that to then terminate and the district will run with a different uh, paradigm for interacting with the Lump community and with uh, LADOC in particular. So, um, bring it to the board first. Any comments on the implementation of the changes to the response? I have one minor request on page item, it's a page 20, um, and this is 313, and this is item F1 in the last sentence, and this is just a minor linguistic thing, we have added a plan of attack, and I would, for linguistic reasons, request that you respect, respectfully request you change that to plan of action. I like that. In keeping with our desire for a less acrimonious paradigm. Okay, the last, okay, the, in F1 on page 20, we have added a plan it says, the last sentence says, we have added a plan of attack addressing the larger issues. And I would request that instead of attack, you just change the words. Oh, okay. I, I thought I heard something else. Okay. No, just in keeping with what's happening. Okay. Um, That's all. Anybody else in the world want to comment or comment perhaps on that suggestion? I think that's fine. I, it's, it's sort of... A common phrase that everybody understands. Okay. Um, then, fine with me. Okay, fine with me. That's a better word. Mm -hmm. Okay, and any other um, okay, comments about the rest of the document? So I. I like the, the change in um, the recommendation. We just added this as soon as possible within the next six months just to indicate acceleration when feasible. Okay. And that we set a time down. Yeah. Okay. Very well. Um, and as far as uh, extending the ad hoc committee, kind of consensus that that's okay. yeah. a good idea. I think we need some mechanism <coughs> that's the appropriate one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very well. Um, then I'll take it to the public for any comments on this. Good morning. Of course, I have comments. But um, last month, you, you've been taking comments from the public for several meetings, and you haven't really taken any of the advice I've given. And last month, you scoffed at me when I said, this sounds good, but I wonder if you're actually going to do it. And um, it brings to mind the Blue Ribbon Panel to study glyphosate. We haven't heard back on that. That was a public promise as well. My observation is that I think the sport is having a hard time getting their head wrapped around this committee is totally different than all the other committees. 
It, by nature, must be independent. And it requires board and staff support only, not board and staff direction. <coughs> All the answers in the response indicate that you wish to retain a very tight control over who makes decisions and what the outcome is going to be. And I think that it would be really healthy for the sport to just take a good step back. The grand jury says that Laddock needs the authority to carry out their duties. And I'm not really reading that authority given. Um, it also excludes the engineering projects, which I believe, and I have stated before, are integral to this whole process. They cannot be separated. I accept that at this point you're not ready to do that, but that will be have to be fixed in the future, and it will be included because it's a very important part of the oversight duty. Um, at the last administration meeting, there was talk about the Form 700. This has to do with your wanting to do ethics training and how people find, sign the 700. It's a declaration of financial interest. And Brian Lee reported that it is not required of any public member of any other committee, only Laddock. And the reason he is not requiring it of any other committee is because he's afraid that it would scare people away from wanting to volunteer to be a citizen member of the committee. So evidently, that doesn't apply to Laddock. I don't like that. I think if you want to require the Form 700, it's not a big deal. Required of every public member, or required of none. It currently is, Debbie. Well, I no. do. Um, I'm sorry. The board members are required to do it. Anyone who can make a vote to spend district money is required, according to what I understand what the attorney's advice was, and that it is not required of people who are giving recommendations. And LIDAC certainly has is making no recommendations on spending money. They're only evaluating which money has been spent already, so it doesn't apply. I would like that removed. Um, on formal training for an assessment district is not really news to anybody. We've been asking for this for two years. In fact, I would like to finish my statement. Finish, wrap up your... There, in November 2016, the Little Hoover Commission did a study for the whole state on how they could get consolidations of special districts going better, what needed to be done. Lois Hendry and I testified at that. And one of their main points was that districts needed training and expertise on how to do assessments and measures. So that isn't news. The formal training on working with the public is very much needed. I worked in civil service in two different places. And quite frankly, any of my staff or if I acted on some of the staff here, we would have not lasted. And I think that's really important here in a public business sector. And getting the training is really valuable. How much? How much more do you have there to read? The ad hoc. How much more do you have there to read? Twenty seconds. Okay. On the ad hoc committee, I believe Director Bobman needs to take a really big step back. You've been very involved in LADAC so far, and what I think this committee needs is a fresh voice and a fresh start. And I would have agreed that John Hayes could step in that capacity. And in your recommendations, you say to assign a board member as the liaison. And I think you should go ahead and do that. And you should close out the ad hoc committee as soon as possible. This district is short on trust from customers, especially in Long Pico. And I would like to see these changes that say we trust you, because then we can trust you back. Thank you. Would anybody else like to comment? Um, Lois is speaking here. Right, and I see Tony in the front row. Front row means in this one. I'll catch you all with the next one. Okay. Um, I just, one thing that I wanted to make the point about is that in the grand jury report, they clearly said that they they expected the, the um, SLB and um, Water District to work with the LADOC in coming up with a response to the grand jury report. So when you created your ad hoc committee, I don't understand why you didn't invite members of the LADOC committee for us to be able to uh, respond to those the LADOC related questions. And um, and I do believe that um, something needs to change. We need to have and, and, and there there is just no trust. That it, I feel 
the, um, the board treats us, I, 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 they, they just treat us like we're, we're um, their enemies. And we don't want to be your enemies, we want to work together. We, again, I'd like to say that Lompico really appreciates the, the merger. And this is not what we expected. We want to work with you, and we want to be able to spend our money fixing our, uh, our problems in our district that have been uh, pointed out in the assessment district. So that's maybe we can, you can make that part of the response, that moving forward, we will work together. So that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, um, Lois. Lois Henry. I worked on this merger from 2010 until 2016. The reason that the former board members of this district put in a committee, a five-person committee of people from Lompico is so the people of Lompico could feel comfortable that everything was being done the way it should be done, that board, or that committee, I mean, needs to represent the people of Lompico. They don't represent you. They don't need to fight you, but they are there to protect the rights of the people in Lompico and what the merger was all about. And unfortunately, I've seen where some committee members are just wanting to be, oh, they think they, think they need to kiss up to you. And that, that shouldn't have to happen, period. This committee should be separate, and they should be able to freely say what they think. They need to understand the Brown Act. They need to understand their role. They need to be informed people. And some people on the committee haven't really even known what the rules were for the assessment. So it would be nice if we had informed people on that committee. Thank you. Okay. Um, Bob, Mr. Foltz. Yeah, Bob Foltz, Mullen Creek. So I, I, I think when you read through the document, any fair-minded person would say this, the commitments such as they are being stated are very general in nature, very wishy-washy. It isn't the kind of thing that you go in and say, okay, we're going to do this by this time period, this by this time period, this by this time period, so that folks can actually understand to what level of accountability they're holding the board for actually doing an implementation. This looks very much like it was written by PR handlers and politicians and people that are saying, well, we'll put it out six months and everything will be fine, trust us, it, it'll be all good. That's, that would have probably been okay two years ago, but as of right now, given what's <clears throat> happened over the last couple of years, that's probably not enough. But if it is all that you can do, I think we understand that. Um, any other public comment? Um, Mr. Hall. Yeah, I just want to say that, uh, you know, I, I tried to get in the room here. Uh, it's kind of crowded tonight. Um, and Steve Yurgovich uh, is a spouse of a board member, and uh, he, he uh, stood in the doorway and tried to keep me from... Oh, I'm sorry, but this is not actually addressing the grand jury. Well, I think it is, because... Um, then, then show me that nexus pretty quickly. How to address the grand jury. Well, I think the grand jury report is about transparency and about how this district does business. And uh, if you think one of your spouses can stand in the doorway and uh, threaten to call the sheriff when someone comes here, that's your trip. That's what it's all about. Go for it. <clears throat> Anybody else? Um, Mr. Yu? I'll come, let me come back to you in just a moment. Sure. Okay. Um, was there somebody? Uh, I think I saw Lou. Okay. Yes, Lou Ferris Sultan. 
uh, given the fact that there are findings on this grand jury report that were also on the grand jury report four years ago, I would like to ask the question, what, like transparency, Margaret was, was wrinkling her brow, so I'll, I'll just give you an example of transparency. Uh, what are you going to do to make sure that we really fix it this time? For example, I agree with Bob that it seems to be fairly general, or motherhood and apple pie. You do have dates, but you know the, the specifics on actions and what the results are going to be is just not there. I would like to see something that has an actual picture or draws or describes a picture of what success looks like when it comes to transparency. And put that in the report and hold yourself to it. Thank you. Um, you still want to? Yeah, let's go with transparency. I didn't block anybody's way. I didn't threaten to call the sheriff. That's all I got to say. Okay. Um, anybody else? Okay, I don't see any other hands up at the moment, so I'm going to close out oral communications and bring it back to the board. I see well, somebody. I, I want you to sort of address um, Lou's comment about details because I think that is okay. important. But I do think that's something that the full board needs to work on rather than ad hoc committee. And so, whereas I appreciate the desire to have an action plan and, and details is critical, I want to be involved in that, um, not just leave it to the ad hoc committee. Um, so that's definitely something that I think the full board should be involved in. Not that I don't trust the general direction of the ad hoc committee. That's our responsibility as well. And I look forward to participating in that process. I think one of the struggles that we have had as a board and as a district, and the community has as well, is grappling with what does transparency mean. It's not just putting all the documents on the website. That's not clearly not adequate to put transparency out as just, here you can see everything we're talking about and everything we do. So to Lou's point, I think there's, there's a deeper structural thing, like the charter for the LADOC needs to be more than one sentence. The parameters for their success needs to be more clearly defined. Everyone wants to do something that they can feel contributing and successful to. So I would like to have as part of the ad hoc committee's work going forward and with the LADA and other committees that clear, what are the parameters of success? And how do we describe this so that everyone's clear on their role? That's a part of transparency as well. It's the transparency, the mutual transparency of what we expect of our committee members, board and public, as well as what the public should expect as the outcomes of those committees. I would find it quite reasonable for this to be um, what the ad hoc committee is doing and how the progress is doing on this to be a regular agenda item for at least six months. Um, I think we have agreed with the grand jury report and set a framework for doing this, and the work has just begun. And um, I, I look forward to this. I think um, we haven't had the structure to do this, and we haven't had um, you know, an outside voice giving us okay, feedback on what we have done. And I think this has really changed things. Um, John, do you yeah, in particular? Yeah, I concur. And I really I appreciate the feedback. I mean, I would love to have more detail in here. And I, I think as we developed this, we, we looked at previous grand jury responses and <coughs> we kind of struck a balance point between having lots of detail in here that would, you know, really lay it out like you would if you were, you know, in a big company and doing a <coughs> plan, you know, kind of, kind of thing. And <coughs> retaining, you know, backing off on the detail, dialing it back a little bit and giving us more flexibility to figure out exactly how we needed to implement some of these things. Lots of people had different ideas, so I, I totally, Bob, I appreciate what you're saying, and others, I appreciate what you're saying about, you know, there could be more detail in here, and we actually had in various drafts more detail in here, and bullets, and implementation dates, and those kinds of things, but really wanted more flexibility in, in moving forward. Um, and uh, let's see, Deborah, you had made a comment about Form 700, and I don't know where you, Got that information. Admin committee, class okay. admin committee. Okay. So, so, but us public members, I was a former public member of the finance committee and definitely had to do a form 700. That was a requirement. And Bob, I assume, is Bob still there? Bob, do you do the form 700, I presume? Um, I do, but the, I don't, I do, but I don't, it wasn't necessarily 
mandated as a requirement, it was more like a suggestion. So I went oh. ahead and did it. Okay, yeah, me too. I thought it was a requirement. <laughs> no. But in any case, we, we did them and didn't, you know, have, have no issue there. But so it's, their, it's the board manual that is inconsistent. Okay. With the the um, procedures. Okay. All right. So I, I think that uh, I'm chomping at the bit to, first of all, restore LADOC to the proper number of members. <laughs> and secondly, uh, you know, get a charter together. And Tony and you and I have talked about this many times in the past about getting right. more than a one sentence charter. Yeah. You know, that let's get a real charter. And I've got a half a dozen examples of charters from similar committees to run by the committee once it gets together so that we can get a charter, we can get a report format, we can get the exact process for um, for producing the annual report and let's get going uh, you know we're it's time to do a report let's do it so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that and hope I can stay involved in that. I'll go to you in just a second but I, I want to say I'm sorry that LADOC did not have enough committee members to meet with LADOC um, we're going to fix that tonight I hope yeah okay and um, and Tony I did reach out to you multiple times during the process Right. We emailed you, each other. You allowed me to. That was get that was. We couldn't have a meeting because you didn't have a quorum. Mm -hmm. So that was the best mechanism we had for getting some input from you, and we used your, uh, you know, mm -hmm. some of your input. Not not, not all of it. See it. <laughs> but, uh, it's the spirit of it is in okay. here. Mm -hmm. And likewise, I, I reached out to Marianne as well. Okay. And and I would just chime in that the board policy manual is currently. Um, undergoing review and revision in the admin committee. I mean, the, the issue of Form 700 filing is certainly part of that conversation. Yeah. And I feel strongly that all committee members should file. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a consistent policy for me. Mr. Well, <coughs> you know, I mean, I work with Lois. I wasn't quite involved as what she was with the merger committee so for eight years on the Lampico board, and, um, you know, I, 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 you know, nobody could question how much I've, you know, chimed up. It started when I first sat on this board about the surcharge and showing that that was an affair with the good help of Director Hayes, just basically to show that that was not working right. But everything that Lois said is absolutely correct. It's just, that, that, that the LADAC is to do exactly what you stated. Um, and, um, and then basically my feeling, you know, you could almost see me exploding right now. And, you know, I, I probably should be really irate because it, it started with the first year of me not being able to attend the engineering committee meetings by scheduling of one meeting a month um, when I was working over the hill during the day, so I couldn't attend, and I kept going on and on and on about, hey, I'm just here as an elected official to provide, you know, what I think is a project management experience. Gina, are we on topic here? Yes, we are. Gina, are we on topic here? Bring it back to the grand jury. Bring it back, okay. The, okay, well, I'm bringing it back right now is that my, uh, expertise as a project manager that well, the Long Pico assessment district is going to go over budget about a million dollars and it's also a liability and I'm talking about we could have replaced those nine pressure reducing valves and the service laterals go out right after the assessment Bill, district. Bill, we need to decide whether we're going to what if any were they going to approve the grand jury report as it's here now, or with um, mm -hmm. one small change, if it has been okay, um, suggested. Is, okay, well, let me explain. The grand jury report is all about Lone Pico. I mean, it's 80% Lone Pico. And it's all about how Laddock's performing. Da -da -da -da. Okay. And I'm just trying to explain to you that the, the failure of the way that the Lone Pico assessment district has struggled along, and they're they're responsible for um, overseeing it and exactly what Lois described about uh, of, of monitoring that um, to to, uh, to do that, and that's how it relates. That they, you know, you need to have all the information 
um, to move forward to, to, to watch the projects and, and see them move along. Finally, thankfully, we are. We're going to replace four of the PRBs. We're going to do a lot of the, I understand we're going to do a lot of things. And we're about to release the contract for the um, engineering design for the, um, uh, all the tanks, all of the tanks, which is a bit huge. You will, hopefully if you get on the board, you will be, you start to get the information and hopefully we can iron these things out. As far as uh, this stuff, turn it, just turn in your response. I don't really have any comment. Like I said, you know, I've been, I've been <laughs> moaning about Long Pico since I've been on this board and there's been a lot of really dumb political games of, with me to say, we didn't, we had a committee meeting and we didn't even vote on the recommendations. We had a long, productive meeting and we didn't even vote on recommendations. We devoted on one that got denied and it was about Mont Pico. And so, you know, I'm done. I don't, I don't really care. Send the send whatever you got in. I don't even have any comments on this whatsoever. Okay. Well, and just a, a follow-up comment. Um, I think it is significant that, again, primarily about Long Pico and for I appreciate the general framework that the Aloha community set up, and I think it's going to be useful having um, a quorum on Lada because that will allow productive working on that one. But just kind of want to reinforce that individual directors can act to make decisions for the whole board. So they can develop recommendations with LADOC and bring them to the full board. And that's when we can discuss and, you know, maybe get some new ideas. Yet, I don't have anything specific in mind. I think that'll be informed with what the others bring back. Um, hopefully we'll get not just um, LADOC committee members, but maybe some community members from Long Pico who aren't involved with LADOC but have the time to come to a single meeting or two. I'm hoping that we'll get... Because that the community is a lot bigger than you know than we've seen at, at public meetings, so maybe this will be a chance for them to get their feet a little bit wet. Mm -hmm. But I think there's plenty of, of um, sort of foundation here, which I think is in the right format, and we just need to flesh out the details um, first from the ad hoc and the lad hoc people, and then bring it back to the full board for a. Mm -hmm. uh, Brief, you know, detailed discussion and provide some of those action plans um, again that um, that Lou was suggesting are appropriate. So I, I think we've got the the timeline set up. We've got the people in place that can do the work, and when it does get back to board level, um, I'm looking forward to having some of that discussion. Yeah, I, if I could just respond to a couple things that Bill yeah. just su suggested. So. In R2, if you look at R2. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, um, I can't hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll speak up. So in the response to that, that really addresses the assessment district, and there's some kind of new ideas in there that I hope you picked up on. Um, we're going to make things a lot more visible as to the projects that are happening, what's the dollar amounts associated with them, what's the project status, you know, exactly what the schedule is for the project. So that will all be published on the district's website. That's part of our commitment here. The, the other part of the commitment is um, we are creating the high-level project summaries. That's we are liaison, okay. I think, is important. So we're going to create the lia liaison to deal with any questions or issues related to this project status or priorities. Um, and we've also said that, you know, the, that those projects are really the purview of the engineering committee, which is you. And ultimately the board, but the engineering committee is kind of responsible for keeping this all updated. Uh, so we're going to, our goal here is to make the information about the assessment district just a lot more accessible, visible, so there's no confusion about what the status of anything, how we're going to spend the money, how much money we need, you know, you, you talked about maybe it's going to overrun, we don't know, but there are projects also in the original engineer's report that we're not going to do, we already know that. So the other thing we're going to do is create a process for when you have an assessment district like this, it's important to, you know, if, if there are changes in the project list that happen, you need to, it's just common sense. Well, the assessment district can change, and there's going to be a process for that, that Gene is actually going to help create, right? That uh, will allow us to say, hey, we're going to remove a couple projects here, how big should the assessment district be? 
Maybe it's smaller than it is. Maybe we don't need as much money. Maybe we need more. But uh, it allows us to change the size of it, the scope of it, it to keep not up with the, with the Of course not. If it increases, it needs the prop 218 process, right? Right. Yeah. But so it, there's a standard process, but but it, it can go the other way. Or changing other projects within it. Yeah. Okay. Does not but there'll be a process which doesn't exist right now. There's like if, if a project changes, what do you do? Well, we'll have a an answer to that. So we realize we need a lot more depth around this. Yeah, that's all good. But I, I hope that those things make you feel better. I know my sitting in on the lab um, meetings recently, I felt very comfortable with the staff support to that. Um, Okay, committee, and um, adding a board member or two. Okay, okay. In addition to staff, I think we'll get a channel that comes, gets back quicker to the board. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is a, really a sea change in how okay we're going to interact with this uh, group of people. So I I really look forward to it. Um, it'll be a lot more transparent. Right, and I think it'll be a lot. Friendlier, a lot. Um, so, yeah. Well, it has Ms. Anne Okay. Um, so, I think there's a lot of good stuff in it. Too, but, uh, it's it's what we do with this. Okay. And I think you guys did There's been skepticism about whether it will happen, and there's no way to okay. resolve skepticism okay. except for time. Yes. That is the Proof is in the book. Okay. Um, so, do we want to do this maybe in a couple of pieces for we book? Okay, because I think we still want to address the app and maybe we'll do that. And make a, so, I, I would maybe. make a motion to approve the response to the grand jury with the minor editorial change as part one of a two part discussion. Okay. The second part being the ad hoc Okay, I don't know that we need a formal vote on it, but what do you... Uh, on the... Oh, on the, on the report, report we need to report, do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we should be not clear about what the change is from the word attack to the word action. Okay, and or throughout, anywhere. I'm not sure. No, it's just no, only, no, just one, on page it's only 20. one place. Only one okay. thought of page 20. Yeah. So the phrase goes from plan of attack to plan of action. And I think that's pretty easy to keep track of in the process. So, okay. Um, I'm happy with that. Um, just do it on a voice uh, voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Good. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, good time to get this done. Um, and on the ad hoc. Um, on the ad hoc committee for the continuation of the ad hoc committee for a period not to exceed six months. Okay. Which would coincide with the conclusion of the stated planned activities to respond to the grand jury report and findings and report. And I would make a motion that the existing ad hoc committee members, Director Hayes and President Brockman, constitute that ad hoc committee. And continue to fulfill its purpose, guiding the response, the district's response to the grand jury report for the next six months. Okay, and you did that at 7:52, so we'll, we'll get that okay, exactly recorded. And, okay. Um, okay. Um, could I hear a second to that? That's my vote. A second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any. <laughs> further discussion. Well, I just, I've just got a question in, in one of those, and it may be R2, it may be R3, you talked about the workshop style meetings. I'm assuming that would be, again, the ad hoc committee that would be. Um, is that envisioned as that, or is that envisioned as the full board? Just, just for clarification. Is this no, no, I, I was thinking. Uh, I mean, I don't know that that's determined at this point. It, it may be. It, if it's not determined, it's, then I'm fine with that. I wanted to. I like to keep things open until we have a chance for for more detailed discussion. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that the ad hoc committee will exist at okay. the time that these public All right. workshops. Occur. Thank you. Okay. It wasn't specified, but that was kind of the way I was reading it. Uh, yeah, I think the workshops are regarding the annual right. reports, which yep. wouldn't occur until after okay. the next. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Bill. Oh, uh, I, I think that I should be working on this committee with John, and so I'm going to vote now. Okay. Um, 
I like the idea of a sticking. I think we got a good process started, John, and I look forward to having you know the implementation phase, not just the um, the planning and okay um, the outline and having this fleshed out. So um, already taken public, so I don't think we need to bring this back. I mean, to the public for comment on this. So if there's no more discussion, um, let's take a roll call vote. Um, Director Smallman? No. Director Hayes? Uh, yes. Director Ratcliffe? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Chair Walkman? Yes. Point of order. I don't know what you just voted on. It, are, have you just approved the final response to the grand jury? Or no? Yes or no? no? We approved the final response with one change, and we also approved the continuation of this ad hoc committee beyond the conclusion of generating the grand jury response for a period of six months so that we can work together on the implementation of the response. So again, you did approve the Two response. Separate votes. Two separate votes. I understand. You did approve the final report to the grand jury. With a one word change. With a one word change. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's move on to new business. And um, new business is item 10A, the Juvenile Salmon and Steelhead Habitat Monitoring Program website. So, I, well, this is something, okay. Oh, you have tons of them. Okay. Yeah, tons of them. Yeah. Looks like it's a stack, so we should be able to do really well. I have one. Okay, there's another The district participates in watershed maintenance and restoration efforts throughout the entire Santa Cruz County. There's multiple agencies that participate in that. Uh, the county takes the lead <coughs> on a number of these projects, and this particular project is the Steelhead Monitoring Program. And the county prepares a website that is um, GIS passive and it's a very beautiful website. I cannot encourage people enough to go visit this website. It is very impressive. They won third place on a national or international? International. International program <coughs> through ArcGIS, the, the company that makes the GIS software. Um, it's pretty, I'll let you. Turn it <laughs> 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 yeah. Go. All right, they won um, this, so this one. Steelhead Monitoring, Steelhead and Salmon Monitoring Program has been going on for 20 years in Santa Cruz County, throughout the county. And um, the data has been collected by Don Alley. And we took all of that data from those reports and put it into a database. And then it's linked to this very interactive website that um, was entered into the 2018 Esri Storytelling with Maps contest and won third place in the international competition under the category conservation, environmental, environment, and sustainability category, as one of the best story maps to illustrate efforts aimed at protecting the planet's natural environment and ensuring the sustainable future of humankind. So it's a pretty prestigious award, and I just we wanted to make sure that everybody could enjoy the website and was aware of the website. It's very interactive and easy to use, and can learn a lot about the current status of fish in our watershed and what we can do as a community to improve habitat for steelhead, to bring them back to our river. It's um, cool. It's cool. I had some. Let's not forget what, I mean, last year, um, you know, when you, you came out and you and Kirsten requested to Put a monkey wrench in the fish monitoring so because you needed website. you needed more resources to create this thing. Right. And now here we're sitting here again tonight, and so it didn't seem like too much of a problem to come up with an award-winning website. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, my question is, why didn't you just come out and um, in the beginning and say, hey, look, we need. You know, we need this and that to, to create this website without, we spent, I don't know, four meetings. I mean, I'm, re I'm requesting, I, I, I mean, <laughs> seriously, I want a, a letter of apology to me, to Don, from Chair Hoffman, this is okay. not acceptable. For, 
I'm not going to have a board member sit here and berate the subordinate staff. Um, well, that's fine. I mean, we we did waste a lot of time going okay. back and forth on this. No, I'm, I'm not, I don't need to speak much longer. But uh, it's a matter of topic, not time. Well, I, I don't even, I'm not being able to at this here. website because you know we went through a lot of trouble and we and we we almost didn't uh, take the fish monitoring. Project, so. Do you understand how much work the county, other agencies, and our staff have put into supporting fish monitoring, supporting the work of Don Alley, and ensuring that there is a credible communications tool to, um, to convey the importance of their scientific work? Okay, well, on both of you, okay, the recommendation is... It is recommended that the board review this memo and celebrate the award to support the Santa Cruz County Resources <laughs> Program monitoring efforts in the San Lorenzo River watershed in partnership with other agencies. We're going to disagree on things that are related to this, but I don't think we should be taking away the, um, the congratulations to the people who have done this, especially to the GIS people who have done something phenomenal in doing this. Um, well, I'm not okay. celebrating for the reasons that I stated. You don't need to celebrate, but we need to, okay, but some of us may want to. Um, and I, um, I, feel very, I feel that the combination of um, Kristen working with this and working with somebody that I've never met yet, Austin, but with this, this fantastic group okay, of um, GIS people with a county that is the most open source data for the uh, of GIS data of any place that I've ever found on the I'm web. I'm not going to click on this until I get a letter of applause. Well, okay. um, please. Okay. I, I just want to follow up saying I want to reiterate something that Jen said. 20 years of data collection. That's invaluable and you know 20 years that shows real commitment um, and what I believe this database is is it makes that that investment in that research and all that time available to people. It's one thing to have that notorious three ring binder on somebody's shelf. This makes the data available to people who want to use it. It's putting all the agency's time and investment, and including the investment of the ratepayers, into, into the health of our watershed. You know, healthy fish are like canaries and coal mine. It, there's a direct link between our water supply and fish populations. Yeah, and you wouldn't and have that without, without Don Alley's work. Can I just say, I hope that people visit this site because it's really important. And 20 years of work by any number of people, um, I am happy as a board member. My time, four meetings, and I don't recall that it was four meetings, is irrelevant. What I want to celebrate, and it is worth celebrating, award or not, I think mean, it's great they won an award, but that that data is available to people and it's in a format that anybody can access, I think that's phenomenal. And I think it's a great return on investment, frankly. You know, it's not just um, a dusty spring ring binder. It's out there, um, usable. And um, I think congratulations are in order whether it had won an award or not. Lots of people have great efforts that are never rewarded. It's nice when they are appreciated, so I, I would definitely endorse that. May I just say one, like, one fill, fill in one more gap that maybe Bill didn't quite understand from what's happened through this whole process. And maybe there's other people who don't understand also, but what ended up happening was this board and other water districts have chosen to, ch to fund both the monitoring and this, the development of this website. And then we reorganized it so the county is not overseeing the monitoring program anymore. It's now being overseen by staff at the city, water district, water department. And so that freed up time and space for the county to be able to work on this website. So we reorganized, we added some funding. It was like $10,000 from this water district and other water districts had another amount that they contributed to the website. And so anyway, that's that's how we ended up doing it, and we're doing both the monitoring and we were able to do this website, and so it was really win-win for everybody. So in the end, we all found a compromise, and we all went one. I, I mean, don't make no mistake about it. I'm all in favor of that. But as for the ten thousand dollars before, as for the ten thousand, I need ten thousand dollars to make this website 
and, and everything, the time. Everything would have been gone. So much smooth. Okay. I, I'd like to inquire. Well, okay. point to Normally, when you see something that works very easily and okay is very uh, interactive, there's a lot behind okay that <clears throat> that is the real meat of it. There's a database back there that's doing this. This this is a very inter friendly interactive website, but it takes a lot of data collection to get to that, and it takes the organization of the data into a database that is going to be useful for more than just this one particular instance, it'll be, okay, this is a, a, a friendly, friendly public interaction and there will be uses, usages for this data that are much more fisheries oriented. Um, so it's, this has been a big effort. It's not just getting one nice website done. So, um, if there's no other immediate, um, okay, more board comments, I'd like to go to the public on this. So, um, Lois. Well, I lived here 47 years, getting close to 48 years. And I remember the first time I went to Henry Cowell. And there were so many steelhead. So many. You felt like you could wade in and pick them up by the arm loads. It was incredible. I go to Henry Cowell now. You don't see that. You just don't see it anymore. It's it's sad. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gorman. Yeah, I'd like to say that it really, truly is an amazing website. And you might not get that just from, from going through it. It's done in a story map format. And it, it is so accessible and it is so well organized that just to have it any layman be able to come on and go through it and read it and then there's a number of you know maps and all of the data is linked to the reaches and the studies and to have anybody be able to come on and understand what they're looking at and accept and access so many years worth of data I mean it is truly <coughs> a profound thing to communicate to the public in that way and it's not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, Austin and, I mean, they worked very hard to pull all of that stuff together and to get it into the right format and to, to really make it available um, in, in a way that anybody can look at it and understand it and, and really, you know, get a grasp of what's going on um, and, and get invested in that. And, and I think, you know, the story map format in this website is just an invaluable tool to communicate to the public um, just volumes and volumes of information that have just not been accessible before. And it's really kind of a, a miracle. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I, I want to come back at, at this. Anybody else want to comment on this? Yes. Okay. Can, I just want to remind the board that uh, you have continually violated your uh, water permit in Felton ever since this district acquired the Felton water system. And uh, every year that Brian Lee has been here, you have continued to violate your permit. And uh, if it doesn't rain by October 1st, you'll be in violation once again. So um, I, I think uh, you, you've exhibited that you are completely careless of this issue. The, the issue is that fish need water in the river, in the streams, and uh, there was a public process 40 years ago that established the terms of this permit, and this district has consistently violated its permit. You have no respect for the state law. Uh, so I think you should, we should all celebrate the demise of Brian C. Lee by uh, passing a resolution and, and, and saying that the district will comply with the uh, Felton Water Permit for the benefit of Steelhead and Coho. Anybody else like to comment? I don't see anybody's um, hands up, so I'll throw it out uh, public orals on this. And I want to say Ms. Gomez's comments come from a technical ability. She's a GIS specialist with the county and knows what she's talking about. So um, I value that um, analysis of what the
quality of this work has been. Um, any other um, maybe board comments on this? I just want to say mine came from a non-GIS standpoint, and I think it's great. And, um, I, I don't really care what went on behind the scenes as long as somebody did the work and used that data and all that human work that has gone into collecting it into a usable format. So, very happy. Okay. Um, I'm happy with this. Um, good group of people. Okay, if there's no more board comment, um, I think we'll agree that uh, we're celebrating the award. So let's move on to the next item on uh, new business, which is the multiple variants for 2018-19. Um, Stephanie's not here, but um, Brian, I think... The report, I think, is self-explanatory. This is a yearly function of the district. We have a multiple user variance in our ordinances that allows for... <coughs> parcels to deal with multiple units that are providing service to two separate units or one unit or whatever. We go through this on a yearly basis, make sure the parcels that are in the database are accurate. We actually send people out to, to survey these areas and every year we were required to bring this back to the board for approval of those parcels that meet the multi-use variance in our ordinances. So tonight we're asking for the board to approve through resolution number Three, 1819 to approve the list of parcels for multi-use variants for this year. Okay, any board comment on this? <coughs> for me, any public comment on this? Oh. I, ha I had a, maybe this is just a grammatical thing. Uh, second paragraph under background, the unit was found to be a permanent single family dwelling, both units are occupied, or because the owner failed to send back the necessary compliance form. Should there be another word in there? Because yeah, there, there, that is a that is a grammatical hiccup. Just for the sake of clarity, it might be helpful to explain that this is the unit the unit or units were found the unit was found to be a permanent single family dwelling with both dwelling units or where both dwelling units are occupied. My. That would be my interpretation is that both units were occupied for single family residences, so therefore they are removed from the ordinance, multi use ordinance. Okay. So do we have a, no, somebody got that. Okay, language, you'll get feedback to um, Stephanie on the. I, I got language. concurrence from someone who probably participated in it. Oh, okay. That was the meaning. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, so very well. Any other board? <coughs> Public comment. Make sure. It doesn't seem like anybody wants to comment on this. Um, so, bring it back here. Anybody care to make a motion? Uh, approval resolution number 318 19. Multiple use variance renewals for 2018 2019. And I'll second that. Um, if there's no more discussion, then um, let's do a voice vote on this. Okay. Okay. Director uh, Solomon? Aye. Director Hayes? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Director Ratcliffe? Yes. Chair Bachman? Yes. Okay. Um, let's move on to item 10C, which is the California Special Districts Association 2018 Annual Conference. Um, and the discussion and possible action is regarding the attendance of board members in the C at that CSBA 2018 Annual Conference. So this is just, I hope people have reviewed this, uh, thought about whether they want to go to this, um, and maybe those who do might express uh, an interest in it, and not really a couple of um, <clears throat> I am absolutely interested in going. There's some excellent, excellent items in this year's conference agenda, workshop agenda, and I think um, to the extent that all board members can take the time to do this, this is a great learning opportunity. Okay. Um, anybody else? I'll think about it, but I don't think I can go. Okay, I mean, I think, uh, if I understand this correct, we need to authorize. It, if people are going to go to this and get reimbursed, we need to authorize that this evening. Oh, I don't know. I would look for legal, but I, I'm pretty sure the board can make a blanket authorization that anybody, any of the board members that wants to go can go, so long as they report back. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I, I believe that's right. Uh, you could set limits if desired. Um, on how many attendees it would be? Attendees or expenses, otherwise the standard guidelines would apply. Conference cost plus travel per diem at the federal rate or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. It's in Southern California, right? Indian Wells. Yeah, Indian Wells, Palm um, Desert. I, there were several things. I was able to attend a couple of local ones, um, and I will be um, not able to travel during that period, so I know that I won't be able to attend. But hopefully you'll get some good material and um, bring it back once. Yeah, I don't think I've been to a couple of things, so I think this is not something I... There's good stuff on there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I look forward to... Um, I'm sorry, but it's a good travel distance and more expense yeah. at this point. I'm, I'm, I'm for all the education we can get because we don't get a lot of training <laughs> in this position. So this, the, the stuff that we can get, but the reality is it's an election year and I think it would be, you know, maybe a waste to, to fund all of us to go. I mean, three of us are up for re-election, so and it, it doesn't sound like you, know, so I would, I would stay home. Okay. Until after the election. Okay. It's a great opportunity. Okay. Um, it is. So maybe we authorize for if for, for 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 two just in case somebody changes their mind and if I'm the only one who goes, I will do my best to cover as many bases as I can and come back with a PowerPoint presentation. That seems like a reasonable position. So before we um, discuss it further, I'll let you go to the public on this. Um, looks like, would anybody like to speak an oral on this one? I don't, yes, go ahead. I think it would be a tremendous opportunity for uh, Director Bruce's career. And uh, I think that uh, you might want to consider uh, allowing her to uh, take Mr. Yurgovich along with her uh, because uh, he seems to be doing the board's uh, bidding at the door here. So, uh, very well. Okay, would anybody else want to comment? Ms. Henry. Okay, I've, I've been to this. It's a great thing to go to. Yeah. Uh, if you can go, go. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay, anybody else? What is the uh, time frame for it? Um, September 24th to 27th. Um, I think I saw another hand up at that time, Mr. Ferris. John, being the newest board member, I would think you should rethink going to that. That's my recommendation. Why? Why? Yeah. Because I think you could, as you said, get a lot out of it. If your okay. only concern is it's an election year, I, I, would, I wouldn't worry about that as much as I would worry about being a new director and getting as much in education as, as you can in the shortest period of time. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Foltz. Bob Foltz, Boulder Creek. So, John, I, I promise that, that I won't make this a campaign issue if you go and, and, spend, a, and spend a total of whatever it is, $2,500, something like that, for that. You can rest assured, get educated. And, I didn't make and, that. And, and, <laughs> and, rest in, and rest in peace when you, do, when you go. Well, I'm glad to know you have a sense of humor. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Thanks, Bob. Um, I see no other hands up at the moment, so we'll close the orals on this. Um, so, John, have you been talked into going? <laughs> um, I will certainly consider it. We could, we could authorize three. I believe that we should have representation there. I think this is great. Okay. It looks like some great trends. I've authorized three, and two of us will probably go, and if there's a third that changed their mind, then... Okay. Okay, good enough. Um, Mr. Staff is going to ask for a little clarification. Um, on page 86 of the board packet is the application, and there's conference registration fees, and then there's separate registration fees. And I, I want to make sure that the board, when they authorize this, they authorize conference registration fees. And if they want to authorize any it. separate registration fees, I want to make it clear that they're doing that because last year there was a question whether golf games were covered or not. <laughs> of course. It's what's all about. You know what I found really useful was the um, SDRMA. I attended the SDRMA session at the Monterey one, which is um, governance. Mm -hmm. In this time it's governance. That was well worth it. 
Um, is that an extra? It's a um, it's a pre-conference workshop. Okay. Um, they have a policy and procedure one. They have a governance one. Um, those were a lot of information in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I found those very. They were general. They would be particularly useful for maybe somebody in your position. Um, they weren't as as narrow and focused as some of the little breakouts, but they were a great umbrella, and they really covered things from people who are very up to date on the subject. So I would recommend, particularly for new board members, that that would be a a useful addition to the main workshop sessions. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody like to make a so I would like to a make motion a, of some sort. A, a, a motion that we uh, <coughs> authorize uh, travel and conference costs, excluding recreational activity registrations, but including um, one pre-conference session and the full cost of the uh, of the event for up to three board members. We like twelve twenty five. Eleven twenty-five, especially for our yeah. I think. <coughs> Eleven twenty-five, and and the housing costs. Yeah, and, 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 and the lodging costs. Yeah. Are we members? Yeah. Or some non-members? We're members. We're members. members. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. After second half. Okay. Okay. Good okay. 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 right. um, Eight twenty-five. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, voice vote. Mm -hmm. okay. Director Smallman. Aye. Director Hayes. Aye. Dr. Ratcliffe? Aye. Dr. Bruce? Aye. Chair Bachman? Aye. Okay, let's move on to item 10D, uh, which is discussion of possible action regarding the scope and budget for a contract amendment to the Resource con 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 Conservation District. So between the two of you, okay. Um, so in the, I believe it was in January of this year, um, the district uh, or the board approved the contract with the RCD, with the Resource Conservation District, to acquire the permits to help to support the district in acquiring the permits for the Fall Creek Fish Ladder construction. Um, at during between then and now it became evident that the timing in order to do the construction would take the full amount of time that we're allowed to be in the stream doing the construction in the stream construction which is I think July 1st approximately depending on conditions through October 15th which is a hard deadline so that's how long it will take us to reconstruct the fish ladder basically the whole time and so in 2017, the storms filled the, the fish ladder with debris, and we estimated that it would take approximately six weeks, or three weeks, or four weeks to remove the debris from the fish ladder. And so in order to do the fish ladder construction, we have to remove the debris from the fish ladder the year before, because there's not enough time to do both the debris removal and the construction in the same year. So we had to get all the permits in order to get in the stream in order to remove the debris. And, and so that's basically what this is for because the initial contract was to pay for the construction permits and this is an additional $12,888 that was required for us to develop the documentation to get the permits for the debris removal. So this is just an additional to pay for what they've already done, which they did on the old contract so that we can get it done, we're going to start. We're going to start removing the debris on September 10th this year, and so um, and then they will continue to work with us through the, this fall and next spring to get the permits <coughs> to do the to begin the construction on the fish ladder next July. And the cost associated with the permit will be reimbursable from FEMA for the debris removal. Right. Seventy-five percent. Right, and all the costs of doing the debris removal mm -hmm. will be re reimbursable. Seventy-five percent will be re reimbursed by FEMA. So FEMA has also approved the permit. We've received all the permits, and so we are going to be starting construction in September. So for the debris removal for the debris removal. <laughs> this is the, it turned out to be a two-phase project. 
And so phase one, the debris removal, 2018, and then phase two will be 2019. And we'll have to get another set of permits because the project descriptions are different. And just for clarification, this is, again, it's RCD, but it's not the streamlined permit because they say we can't use the streamlined permit. <coughs> okay, so there's no, the gamut of permits. It's the full panoply of permits. It's the full panoply. Yes. Okay. For, I call it permit for Okay. For endangered species. Right. Okay. Thank you. So is it fairly safe to say that because it's spread out over two years, the permitting is higher, um, there's just inefficiencies in that process, but it's necessary because we just are time limited, okay, in that stream, okay, at that time. It, and it's just it takes, the way it is. It takes time to do that big construction project. So... That time, the time that it will take to do the construction project mm -hmm. was from a Gantt chart from the engineer who designed the construction project who estimated it would really take the full amount of time. Mm -hmm. It's a big project, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, any other initial board comments? Um, so it's not the permit cost so much, it's all, this is all people time, the increases in hours. This, it's just yeah, this time. is the amount of time that it took for, for the consultants to develop the, the documentation yeah. on, on this project, okay. on the debris, debris removal. Project. So, and we'll get FEMA money back from this, we will, the $12,000, the $12,000, $12, dollars the 12, 12, yeah. whatever, that will be 75% uh, reimbursable. Okay. 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 Save the fish. Any public comment? Okay. Opening up for orals. Any public comment on this? I don't see any. Um, I'll be crossing my fingers and toes that we don't get any more debris this winter. Yeah. <laughs> it's generally a low erosion stream. So, you know, for years where there was really not a lot of debris filling the fish ladder because it's a very clean stream with not a lot of turbidity and there's not a lot of siltation happening there. It's like very, But because of the catastrophic nature of the 2017 storms, which you never know when we're getting another one of those, but they're not that Oh, man, so. I mean, this is Fall Creek, which is a pretty un, okay, impacted stream, <laughs> so it doesn't have <laughs> loose stuff laying around for easy, okay, it takes a big thing. It takes 26 feet. Yeah. 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 So I think one of the most exciting things about this project is the new fish ladder requirements, which will be next when that's rebuilt, right? Mm -hmm. And that uh, everything has to be lower and easier for the fish to get over. Our fish have gotten lazy. <laughs> or they're less energetic and they cannot clear a one foot step anymore. They, they gotta... Kids these days. Okay, let me, let, let me stick with um, public input. I th saw somebody back there in the... Barbara, just out of curiosity, how long is that stream? In total. Well, the fish ladder is located. I mean, the debris, the debris is right where the fish ladder is, oh, or it's, it's throughout the, the whole stream. It's in the chambers of the fish ladder. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be just right at that debris. that junction from the fish ladder. Yeah, okay. from the actual chambers of the fish ladder. Okay. Um, who's Henry? Well, I'm with Jenny. I hope we don't have storms again, mm -hmm. and I know this needs to be done. So. Get to it. <laughs> okay, any other public? Okay, I don't see any. Uh, let's bring it back to the board. Um, any other uh, board comments on this? So, do I hear a motion? No, real quick comment. They might, uh, might be an engineering solution to stop the rain on the rain event. Something, you know, do a little looking at it. Let's talk before the next phase. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. It's protected. I would move approval of the scope and budget for the permit requirements for the fall fish creek ladder. For an additional $12,888. $12,888. Okay. Um, okay. Um, no further discussion, I take it. Um, let's just uh, take it on up or down. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Smallman? Aye. Dr. Hayes? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. <coughs> yes. Chair Ball? Yes. Okay. Um, well, let's move on to 
Kim E. Um, looks like a simple big item to get through this evening. Um, I hope people appreciate a little bit of my humor. Um, so this is the Quito Assessment District Oversight Committee member appointment, and it is discussion and possible action by the board regarding the appointment of a new member. So um, the recommendation is that uh, the board review the attached applications and choose um, one of the applications to replace Andrew River, who resigned from uh, the Lumpico X Assessment District Oversight Committee. So, any staff initial comments? I can. The memo is is complete and whole, and staff is. Okay. On it. Okay. On this one, I think I would like to go to orals first, so to give the opportunity uh, for anyone to comment, but uh, including uh, the applicants in case they wish to. Um, there's no necessity to, but it would be a, a time uh, that the, um, and you know, I'm going to ask, okay, Lois, I, I see, and you'll be the first, I want to um, offer this initial to the <coughs> applicants in case they do want to speak so that the, the, the rest of the community uh, knows that <coughs> they, uh, they participate in oral communication. So would anybody like to um, speak? I would be happy to. <laughs> so, just some business to take care of at the beginning. I submitted this application in good faith. I didn't realize it had become so politicized. I was really, really looking forward to working on progress for LATA. And I'm a technical person, I'm a task oriented, and the idea of working on this report was just amazing to me. And I would love to do it. I think that tonight is a real pivotal point for this board because you have an opportunity to put two people on this committee and make get it active almost immediately. I know there is a, I know there's. It's not a secret that Jenny is the preferred applicant, and I, and she's very qualified as well. If the preference was for me, I would insist that you also appoint Jenny. Jenny and Leo have been very active in the community. They've lived here about four years now. And we have worked together on other projects and supported other projects on each other. So I think we as a team, as part of the bigger team, would be really dynamic. And I urge you to do that. And you can do that because you did that already a couple months ago. There was an opening for one person. And then you got two applications and another opening came up. So you pointed both at the same time without having to put any other notice out or any other fuss. So I believe you can do it and I think it should be done. Um, you have my application before you. <coughs> what I didn't include in there is that um, yesterday Ed and I celebrated owning our house for 40 years in Lompico, moving in. And in 10 days we celebrate 40 years of marriage to this very handsome man here. <laughs> 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 I love living in Lompico. I'm very connected in Lompico. I hear a lot about people in Lompico. And I really love the open discussion. We can be really fiery. And you can see Jenny and I can both be very fiery. And you need that. Because that's what people in Lompico expect, that we're going to be dedicated. When I was reading about these kind of oversight committees, universally they said the real priority is they needed people who, were, who asked a lot of questions. And I qualify for that. I am asking lots and lots of questions. Um, I'm very friendly. Two things that I wanted to bring to your attention is um, my experience on two committees while on the Long Pico, as a citizen member in the Long Pico Water District. Uh, 2011 to 2015, I was on the Citizen <coughs> Advisory Committee. This committee was tasked by the board to provide. Um, I'm going to need more than three minutes, and I think that's I think that's care. appropriate for the two applicants. Um, five years, I hope, maybe. Okay. Please. It'll speed along, believe me. Okay. The, this committee was tasked to provide reliable fact-based information about the proposed merger to Lompico customers. Included research, website posts, 
and organizing workshops. We held workshops. We extended out to the community to get questions. We had an amazing website. This website was cited by a lot of different government agencies and linked to theirs as an example of how you reach out to the community. Um, it was a communication success. Our motto was just the facts. Because the biggest issue in Lompico is trust. And I have to tell you, even though uh, we had a majority of people vote for the merger, a lot of them voted very reluctantly because they had to trust that the merger agreement would hold, would hold and involving the county in that whole organization was a big factor for people to believe that this agreement was going to be held and it was going to be successful here. So I think a lot of trust has been lost and I think it's going to be a, need a really dynamic committee to build that back up. And I think you need Jenny and I, both of us, for that. And you need us right away for the next meeting. Um, I was also a citizen member of the Grant and Loan Committee. And I, I included this because I worked with two board members who were very anti-merger, and we were about as opposite as you can imagine. As much conflict as we've had here, there was a lot worse there. I petitioned to be a member of this committee, and I needed both of their permission, and they took a chance. And the result of that was we did some really dynamic work. We put together pages similar to what you have in your package tonight, describing projects, what they were, how much they were going to cost, photographs, all of that, because we went to workshops, and we looked for grants and loans. We attended all kinds of seminars. We brought stuff back to the board. We made reports, very similar to what the LADOC committee does. As a result of that, we brought back a grant to the board, and they did it, for a person to come in for technical, the TMF, technical, mechanical, and financial report that's required to submit a state revolving fund loan. We got that, and they also helped submit the revolving fund loan, all because we went out and we looked for it. If there was any grant or loan that was out there, we were going to get it. And the reason it was successful is because we all agreed this was for the betterment of the district. And we were able to each set aside our own personal differences and take the focus of what was best for the district as, as a primary thing. The second page of my, excuse me, the second page of my submission, now I turned in a PDF that was colored in your package it's black and white and I don't know if it's a terrible copy and there's a reason I wanted you to have this in color. And I don't understand why my application was altered. You'll see at the top Pass around. You can see at the top Return your, please return your water survey. I made these signs. There are, I think, half a dozen throughout the canyon. This was part of what we did with the, uh, over for the advisory committee. Uh, the board said, we need to find out really how people feel about the merger. And so we put out a whole, we, we made up a whole list of what questions we've had so far, and we want to know, what's your response? Where do you want to go? And it was going to culminate in a workshop. These signs got a 43% return of all households. So out of 500, we have 43% return. And that is an amazing result if, you're, if you have anything to do with surveys. Of those, 86% of the respondents said they were in favor of the merger. 8% said no, and 6% said they weren't sure. But we went out, and right below there you'll see, send us your questions, it's very small, I'm sorry, just the facts about the merger, and a sign that we put up on the other side. I worked with this collaboratively, collaboratively with this committee, and I know how to work collaboratively, and I know how to communicate. You'll also see a picture of the Ziani fire uh, vehicle with two blue cubes in front of it. This was for a workshop because one of the major questions we had was, what's the difference between a Lompico unit and an SLV unit? These are the visuals. We know how to communicate. This answered a lot of questions. 
the LADOC committee is going to have to know how to communicate, how to reach out, how to communicate. And I believe I have the experience, and that's what I can contribute to this. Um, the rest of my resume is I have a BA in uh, art from San Jose State University. My major work experience includes civil service, and as I said, I've had a lot of training, um, an amazing amount of training on how to work with the public and on uh, collaborative workshops on brainstorming and how to come up with ideas and how to take a task and move it to an action. I've had a lot of training in that. While I was on these committees, I also had training on the Brown Act and the California Rural Association, Rural Water Association um, on board member duties and how a district operates. So I have a lot of big, deep background on that as well. My husband and I have owned our own business for 32 years. It was in solar hot water heating. We were specialists in big systems and how to maintain them. I wrote hundreds of reports to explain to owners about what, how their systems work, how to evaluate how much money they should be putting into it, what the cost of the return on it was. So I'm very familiar writing reports. And we're now retired, so I have time. But I appreciate your vote. I really think you need both of us. Jenny and I both have a lot of really strong points to bring to this committee, and I think this committee needs to be infused immediately and quit dragging it on. If you're really sincere about what you wrote in your grand jury response, that's going to be the only answer we have. Just to move on that tonight, and I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Boulder Creek. So I think this is really an opportunity for the board to move beyond the sort of generalities and sort of PR handler 
general nature of the grand jury response and actually move to something very concrete. One of the things that this board and future boards are going to have to deal with is um, sort of a generational change in the makeup of this valley. There's a lot of really long-time residents here, and there's also people that are going to be moving in over the next few years. And I think it's really, really important that this board, and we've wrestled with some of this on the admin committee, how we get people involved. And I've reached the conclusion that the way you get people involved is not to turn anybody away that wants to be involved, that there has to be a way for the board to find a place for everybody to serve and volunteer. And I don't think that's particularly difficult to do in this case because there happens to be three openings on this particular committee and two applicants. So this seems like an incredible no-brainer uh, to be able to, um, to fill this role. And I think it would be a really good move for the board, uh, assuming that you all are serious. Um, I mean, I know there's an election coming up and there's a lot of sort of really good feelings going on right now that the board wants to do just about anything possible. Um, so I think this is a really great opportunity for you to follow through on that. And I urge you to balance. There's a balance here of, of deep experience in this process already and a really new voice that I think can bring a lot to the table. And both parties should be honored with this appointment. And I urge you to do so. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment? Oh, Lois can comment. Okay, and then I'll... Oh, I saw Tony in the room. Okay. I think you forget me. Well, it's time to defer to you. You're behind Tony. <laughs> I know. I'm sure. Yes. Um, Absolutely. A little while ago, you mentioned distrust, uh, skepticism. <clears throat> I have to say, if you don't pick both of these people, if you only pick Jenny, which I'm hearing is what's going to happen, there's something really wrong here. Jenny's smart. She'd be a good person, but she's already on a committee. Debbie isn't on a committee. Debbie knows more about it than Jenny does. Pick them both. They would be great. But how can you sit there and say, oh, we hear maybe some skepticism, uh, maybe mistrust? If you only pick Jenny and then say you're going to put a new notice on the website saying you need two board members and asking to people to apply, when you've got two people applying right now, and originally you said you were going to pick two tonight. Now you're only going to pick one. I'm sorry. How can I possibly believe you have any intent of doing what needs to be done for the latter committee with that, with this? Tell me. And I know you won't tell me, but I guess you'll show me by your actions. Um, okay. Well, first of all, I, now have you heard of the Maddie Act? Um, it's um, my daughter who was from the city and brought it to my attention, and it does require that you. Thank you. Yes, you can take a look at it. Oh, you pulled it up. It requires that you do fill these positions as soon as possible. One of the things it also requires is that you post the vacancy and. As I, I, I certainly didn't see it that it posted on your website until you went, nobody knows about that laptop link at the bottom of the page. So why wasn't it on your main page? It was very uh, um, about the vacancy. It was on only on the, if you click down on the laptop one, then you could see it. So that just doesn't make any sense to me that you wouldn't, um, you have the other two vacancies for the other committees, but not our laptop one. So yeah, put, you can check into that. So that was a concern that I had. But also, you said um, Gina indicated that she doesn't see any way that you can um, appoint someone tonight. But it does say in the Madia, the legislative body may, if it finds an emergency um, exists, 
fill the unscheduled vacancy immediately. A person appointed to fill the vacancy shall serve only on an acting basis until the final appointment is made pursuant to this section. So I see a way of you appointing both of them tonight. So sign them both, and then later at your next meeting, the one person who isn't the confirmed one can be confirmed at that time. I do see that um, I kind of, one thing that I take a little bit of umbrage to is that um, that our committee, our committee, well, our hands were tied for so long. It wasn't until Mr. Hayes um, came forward and, and met with me and, um, and, and gave me the idea of going directly to your, um, to the finance committee that we were able to finally get any information at all. We had been trying from day one. We asked to meet with the finance manager and were told no, that we couldn't meet with her because she was too busy. So we had no information. So that's why nothing got done. We couldn't move forward, but we have been moving forward and I feel really good about that. I know that if these two ladies are um, join the committee, that will, with the help of what it says in the, your commitment to meet the um, obligations provided to you by the grand jury report, we'll we're going to do great, and we're going to we'll be we're going to be able to get the job done. Now, let me just say one more thing here. I'm sorry, I was busy. I always ramble, as you know, so I wrote down what I wanted to say about Deborah, so I wouldn't ramble. Okay. So you have two excellent candidates, and both of them should be appointed. What possible reason can you provide for why Deborah Lowen is not being appointed at this time? She would definitely be the most knowledgeable member of the Laddock Committee regarding Lompico Assessment District. No one has invested more time, energy, and support of the merger of Lompico with SLBWD. We would be lucky to have her. We would be harnessing her dedication to making Laddock a success from the inside out. If you can only assign one person tonight, then it should be Deborah Lowen. Jenny Gomez is also a wonderful candidate and belongs on the committee. But if a choice has to be made between the two, it should be Deborah. Any, if you make another choice, then you, we deserve an explanation as to why. But maybe with the help of that act, you can just go ahead and assign them both. Thank you. Um, I believe I saw Lou had his hand up earlier. Did, or maybe I'm. Okay. No. No. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. We want to comment on this. Okay. I don't see anybody else with their um, hands up, so we'll bring it back to the board. Would you like to comment on this? Sure. The yeah, and I, and I will admit I was not conversing in the Maniac before I reviewed it after it was raised in this board meeting. Um, the most important aspect of the MADI Act that I see here, aside from the requirement to annually post lists of who holds the various positions, is specific um, notice requirements for filling vacancies on the board. Um, and I think if there's any concern as to whether the district has satisfied the specific requirements to post a special vacancy notice in the office of the clerk and on the website or at the library and in other places directed by the board, then the, uh, the most conservative way to address that would be to make sure that those notices are posted and address all vacancies at the next board meeting. I do not believe that the emergency uh, provision applies. Um, I mean, appointing one member would satisfy the quorum requirement, but I don't think meeting the quorum of the LADOC constitutes what's typically considered an emergency under the code. Um, however, that is a discretionary finding of the board. Exactly. And we could just, if the board could think of some reasons why it would be an emergency to appoint the more than one report, lot of member tonight, that could be considered by the board. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to get a little staff okay, input before we come to the director. Um, what do it, can we get a basis for what the posting, you know, did the posting fulfill the Matty Act requirement? And is uh, there any question of that? Okay. So, and I was leaning to council on this, but I was under the impression the Matty Act only applied to board vacancies, not subcommittee vacancies. So we did not follow postings at the registrar voters 
Um, it was posted on the website that we had on the website and the LADOC page because we assume that's where all of the people members go for their information. And so we did post it. It was an application. It was an opening. So we did have that on the website, but we did not post it at the registrar's office. Yeah, it doesn't have to be at the registrar's office. Special vacancy notice posted in the clerk, clerk office of the local agency on the website or at the library and in other places designated by the board. Yeah, I don't think we had it posted. The clerk of the local agency, I assume, would be, we would have it in like the bulletin board at the front or something like that one. That's reasonable, yeah. I, 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 would, I would stretch to say that we did that. Did the website? We did the website. No, on the lab page. I mean, nobody, and I'm sorry, nobody goes there. Only we, we on the committee know about that little tiny page. And the first opening was posted on the main web page. The first okay. time around. And the second yeah. time around. Facebook? And Facebook, it says two openings. I have a copy right here. Yeah. Sorry. Two openings to be decided tonight. Yeah. So, so. Uh, let me get the legal okay, yeah. aspect, and then I'll come to the director's opinions on these matters. As well, a conservative. I'm, I'm hearing that the notice wasn't posted in the office of the clerk, and so the appropriate way to follow the Maddie Act would be to post the notice of all. Now we know there are three vacancies. Post the notice of all three vacancies as soon as possible in the office of the clerk and on the website or the library, and then proceed to fill them with um, all the things. But it wasn't done last time when you appointed two people, so those people are no longer valid either. Hello. Yeah, what are you going to do? Are you going to do the right thing, or are you going to just fumble this? Well, we, we've, been, yeah. we've been presented with a legal um, requirement here. Legal I think we, uh, I, I'm sorry, Deborah. I'm sorry, Deborah. I'm sorry, Deborah. No. Okay. Um, we're back at our discussion with legal. Um, so what is... He's not sorry. I mean, it seems to me that we, that we need to, at this point, fulfill the legal... This is not... This is unexpected. Okay to me, but I think that we need to do this right. I can't see that there's an emergency. I mean, you know, when you look at additions or deletions to the agenda, their emergencies are serious emergencies. Um, but I think our choice has to be to, um, to, get, to meet the letter of the law on this. Um, and we haven't in the past. Okay, if there's been anything, you know, we've been, been lapse, it's been brought to our right. attention. Yeah. Okay. We should do it right. Right. May I bring to the attention of the chair a point of order? That means that every citizen member of every committee is not valid. That, um, I'm sorry, Deborah, but okay. That would be something that we would end up, I would ask that question in the, not in this, I can't imagine council being able to analyze this in this, um, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this quickly, what would you? Yeah, I mean that's not an obvious result of right. this past lapse, but that's something I can consider in the, in the process. Um, Okay, uh, let me uh, get any other step. Okay, uh, Director. I, I would recommend we follow a conservative approach that not only honors the letter of the law, but also affords us the opportunity to do additional outreach. Mm -hmm. And oh ensure that there are three vacancies filled. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we have only two applicants at the moment for three vacancies, so we need to do more um, outreach, certainly. Um, other, um, other board bill? No, oh, well, I, 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 I couldn't understand the reason why, you know, there wasn't, why we couldn't, it, it be it set up tonight to, to get both Debbie and Deborah uh, <coughs> for them. So obviously it sounds like to me like we, we messed up on, on doing following the procedure on, on the, I don't know if there's someone tonight that we can say. Obviously, Debbie's way more qualified, so I, I, you know, I vow if there's any way for her to, to be appointed tonight, you know, with, with Jenny, you know, simply waiting another month, or taking this conservative route and just, just say, hey, let's just, try, we'll try to get a third person, and then hopefully in the meeting in September we can, we can fill a lot of it, you know, and with the, I guess we can't make a decision possibly tonight, 
you know, probably with the most highly likelihood that both Miss Gomez and Miss Lowen are, are going to be the next two. <laughs> but you know, because it sounds to me like we just we messed up on the you know on the proper procedures of, and you know maybe we have in the past maybe we had a learning curve to learn how to you know I guess what you said go through the um, registrar and all that stuff. Yeah, but we had I mean we had a lot days. we had a lot of movement day. or uh, take what Miss um, what. Um, what Tony was saying about too, there, then there might be some sort of thing to that, where we can where we can appoint Debbie tonight, and then and then go through the procedure to to get Miss Gomez to uh, to do it. We need we need to get people ASAP on the board, so <laughs> let's not uh, try to delay anything. And then and, you know I'm glad, I'm sure glad that there we have these two uh, people willing to be on the board in a dire time. Um, <clears throat> just, okay, one, just want to make a, a, a response on the Bob still here or not, but I appreciate what he was saying about sort of the generational shift. I think that every member of the community should be equally welcome. Um, I lived in the old, old town, and if you hadn't been there since like the 19th century, you didn't count. And so I think it's great to have both long term residents and newcomers involved. And frankly, anybody who wants to participate. Is is going to be great. So appreciate the diversity in the applicants, but I also um, now that the that the Maddie Act has been brought up, I do think it would be responsible to start the side of caution and um, repost appropriately. And um, that would be my my preference. As my only my only concern would be: Are there any issues that are coming up for the district where having a quorum of the Ladakh is going to be essential between now and sometime in September, when we both have the opportunity to panel, you know, hopefully fill three vacancies, and then the Ladakh has a chance to move? Is there any imp anything that will create a impediment or a bottleneck if we don't focus on one tonight? Um, my belief is there's nothing of that urgency. I mean, we have a, a quarterly report coming up in September. Or is that correct? Okay. The uh, quarterly report is supposed to occur in September at the September ladder meeting. Right. Okay. Okay. So there will, if without a quorum, there can't be a meeting. It will slip a month. And it will slip a month. So. Probably. Okay. Fair assumption. Oh, good. That's the of that. Um, I think that's. And acceptable, okay. Um, price to pay. I mean, I. Um, this needs to be done right. John, do you want? To yeah, I, I mean, I, I think this is an emergency. <laughs> In lots of ways, this, you know, Ladakh was the subject of the grand jury findings, and I think it's imperative that we get it up to speed as fast as possible. And further delays are just really unacceptable. So, um, to me, this kind of is an emergency. I think. It is. And I'd be, I'd be willing to vote for both of them to be on there like right now. Uh, I've worked with both of them. They're <coughs> great. We're lucky to have them. great candidates. So. Uh, <coughs> I, would, I, would take I would love to have both of them. I've got a question for Gina about definition of emergency. Because we had this issue with one of our spring projects mm -hmm. where we had to, the emergency had specific legal definitions and we weren't able to approve an expenditure because it, it wasn't didn't represent a legal emergency, and I don't remember the details, but we were constrained at that point. And I but even if we are constrained, I mean, we could pre-appoint them. I mean, that would be one thing, mm -hmm. I might suggest. Ratify them. And then let's go through the process of the postings and everything, but we have our two next, you know, appointees ready to go and uh, join the committee. But let's, let's move forward. A question about if the process hasn't been followed in the past, and we haven't followed the Matty Act to the T4, the current posting, is there a legal liability we are exposing ourselves to that is has some significance that we should be aware of? Do we have the opportunity to provisionally appoint and ratify later with perhaps a third potential appointee? I don't see a high likelihood 
high level of legal exposure. Do you think ratification is an appropriate step that I was thinking about in the course of looking at the statute and trying to understand what to do with it? Um, with respect to prior appointees, if these procedures haven't been filed, followed, I think ratification is a step that could be used to cure. Um, you know, I haven't really had an adequate amount of time to analyze this, so I, it's something to consider. Well, okay. One of the when I want to bring in one of the thoughts I've had in this process is that we have a significant reset on this, okay, on what going on, and we have had some we have had two resignations, okay. Um, there's been some um, concern. I mean, two, yeah, two recent ones. I mean, two. Um, that were not the, they were a choice, not the public moving out of the area. And I would like to be able to communicate to the one people community that there has been a significant change in how we're going to handle things and reach out directly, okay, and do a direct mailing to the entire community that they're, um, okay, we have a grand jury okay, response available and that we want to solicit. Um, applications. Mm. And I'd like to have a significant number of applications. I mean, I I think that might, uh, well, I don't know what that will produce. We haven't had that experience. And this is something that is doable for a community of 500 people that might seem, you know, overkill for one of 8,000 of the households. Okay. So, um, I think to be safe on that, Okay, that we need to postpone this. Okay, go out and solicit. Okay, um, applications from everybody. Explain. Okay, what this entails to some degree. You know, it, we won't have a full charter at that. You know, at the points, mm -hmm. but we will have a broad. Okay. We'll be able to say something about what it entails. And I'd like um, to come back and. And then consider the two of the applicants we have today with at least one more person, okay, maybe um, two or three, and then work from there. So. I think, I think it's one thing to have made appointments in the past not in compliance with the Natty Act because we didn't know about it. I think there's a certain risk now that we're aware of the Matty Act requirements, if we go ahead and make approvals with the full, full knowledge that the posting wasn't done in compliance, I think there's a legal risk there. Not a significant one, but it doesn't have to be significant to cause problems down the line. So um, I think it would require that quarterly report be pushed back till October. But um, and I, I had not even occurred to me to do something like a direct mailing. That's mm -hmm. that's sort of a Which is overkill. Well, well, it's, well, it's, it's, it's a too. novel idea, but again, you know, in view of the um, grand jury report, um, maybe it's not it totally out of, out of range, but... How much is that going to cost? You already posted in the press banner, on Facebook, on the website. Well, it's, I, I think there's some people who don't think we've given it enough publicity. No. Um, there's some people who um, think you haven't Deborah, moved. Yeah. Let's not, Let okay. me just this finish is, my comment. Some time. people who obviously are concerned that there wasn't enough exposure or that it was hard to find. Um, others of you that seem satisfied with the publicity. Um, but my concern <coughs> is what does that knowledge that we are now in possession of have to do with our legal liability if we continue with this process. Then I move that you invalidate the last two appointments because they yeah. were done without following the matter. <coughs> My point is we were not aware of the Doesn't make any difference. You are. That is exactly the point that I'm making. Now that we are aware of those provisions of the Matty Act, now we know that the correct procedure What's to be followed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think that it's a slightly different position. You know, in fact, we didn't know before it was done um, innocently, uh, inappropriately. Now that, we're, innocently. That now that we are, uh, Deborah, uh, now know. that we are aware of those provisions, um, I think it's our obligation to follow them. 
You know, we're never going to satisfy everybody here. There's, there's going to be people who are um, unhappy with whatever our actions are. So I think That's for sure. my inclination would be to follow legal advice on this one. So I'll go back to Gina and just see what your reaction is to my concerns. If the notice wasn't posted in the clerk's office, this is something that can be resolved in the course of this process. It should be done unless a finding of emergency is made. Can you clarify emergency? I have not had an opportunity to look up the definition. Um, in the past, it had something to do with the peril of life and limb, kind of. When we were talking about expenditures for the fish ladder, yeah, it, it varies by context. Mm -hmm. So in that context, it was health and safety type emergencies, mm -hmm. usually emergencies that result from fire or flooding, etc. Um, I briefly looked at the definitions in the Maddy Act and didn't see a definition of emergency. Would there be circumstances, I guess, for an appointment, appointment would, I mean, if you had a board that couldn't meet and you needed to make, you know, if you had the governing body didn't have enough members and you um, needed to get to, you know, a decision point where you had something serious that was going to be a consequence of it. That seemed, yeah, I mean, something like that seemed to me like it would be an emergency. I mean, a clear example would be that we have a uh, penal code imposed yeah. deadline for submitting a response to the grand jury report. If the board, well, can't do this for a board member, but if the committee had the authorization to sign off on that report and they were lacking a quorum, such that they couldn't meet the requirements of the penal code, that might be an example of emergency where you need to get to a quorum to so take an action. Yeah. It sounds like the definition um, is but I, but I can't define emergency for you. I didn't see one in the Maddie Act. Um, and I haven't had an opportunity to research it to try to together more substantive definition. Well, I, I know I understand what you're saying, John, but you, sure. do you understand my concern yeah. about now that we're aware of this, it, the circumstances may be somewhat different. Yep. Um, and that's my concern is it wasn't a deliberate oversight. Um, no, of course not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can they serve on an acting basis that just that it's an emergency because we do have to work on the grand jury response. The community wants it from you. Well, and that's why we're concerned about emergency because when we had, we, I was and it's unfortunate that there's not a definition there in the Maddie Act <coughs> because I was surprised at how stringent the conditions had to be for an emergency with, related to this other project. Um, so it makes me kind of skeptical, a little doubtful. Um, and it would be, you know, I, I, I appreciate your suggestion of like direct mailing, but I do think that would involve a longer delay than, mm -hmm. than following the requirements of the Maddie Act, which are simpler. We just have to make sure that we're in compliance with that. And perhaps some supplemental social media type outreach. But as long as we meet the requirements of the Maddie Act, we could get turned around quicker. Um, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be expensive. Uh, what's the, what's the, uh, I'm sorry. 10 days. Go ahead. No, it's, it's 10 days. Mm -hmm. Not that, it only has to be posted 10 days and then you can assign something. Could we, could we post it, do a special meeting in 10 days or so? Yeah. And yeah. Stab all three. Hello. <laughs> Stab all three at that, at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Work hard to find another candidate or two. <laughs> I, I think we have to reach out very aggressively in order. I mean, we've only got two people at this point. You know, we have okay two qualified people. Yeah. So we, but we don't have enough. Okay, but we don't. We can't. It, we haven't reached out well enough to get a full complement on it, and we need to do that. Volunteers are hard to come by. Right. Yeah. And we haven't had any applicants for the uh, finance, but the finance position. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, and, and in, in light of that, what would the difficulty be with the provisional appointment of the two applicants to none? Conduct an outreach campaign so that at the next regular meeting, we can have 
a review of any additional applicants for the remaining vacancy and a ratification of the two candidates Works who for me. are oh, yeah. Good idea. <laughs> Do you know do you think the ratification process would be appropriate here? I mean, do you, just, do you see a problem with that? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, it's a little tricky. To, I'm sort of being asked to get legal opinions yeah. on the fly. Yeah. Kind of things. Um, oh, hello. Ratification could be an issue here because um, the issue is notice to other community members. So, how do you have a quorum with somebody who's provisional? <coughs> well, I mean, the board manual doesn't really make any. Doesn't say you can. <laughs> I mean, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think somebody would either be a, under the board manual. Somebody would either be a to the committee or not. Sure. Um, if you make a ratify, if you ratify, aren't you making a de facto appointment and you're intending to, okay, to make it an official later? Yeah, so you've exactly. actually done the deed yes. okay, when you made the ratification and that's subverting the intent of the, okay. I can see might, where, might, might, where might. ratifications might legitimize appointments made prior to our knowledge of the NATI Act. Correct. Correct. That seems to make sense. But could, now that we're and, aware and of the Maddie the, Act. And, and the two applicants could be appointed this evening to fill two of the three vacancies. Yes. And we could, as Jimmy uses the term, cure the fact that we did not post a notice in the clerk's office and it was, you know, a 10 day period and in the library, whatever else we needed to do. But that ratification, to use the term, would cure that logistical lapse, that administrative lapse of not having it in the window of the, of the, the office. Um, this is strange to me, I think. And uh, again, the actual item says one. Okay, that, we haven't changed, okay, um, that fact, I we're going to ratify one, two, this is getting very... Why did it only say one? Um, when you had two, and you've got three vacancies. It's in the agenda as one. Who wrote that? Why? Love it or okay. Okay. This is getting ridiculous. Guys. You appointed okay. two when it said one and, and two months ago. Oh, oh. Mr. Um, no, no, come on. Okay, we, this is something we have to work out. I'm on the board about whether there is a way we can proceed on this. This is... It is difficult enough with five board members trying to figure out how to do this. So, um. I, I, have a, I have a recommendation, as much as it chaps my hide, to draw things out because I prefer moving things along. But because there was miscommunication to the community about the number of vacancies, a Facebook post contradicts the current agenda. Because there are three openings, there are two candidates in the whole number. I recommend that we stop this at the moment, freeze frame this, and as you suggested, go back out to the community, re-solicit for the three vacancies, and consider this fully, again, with all applicants, after having followed the Medi Act to the T, mm -hmm. in a September meeting. If, if that was a motion, I would have... Okay, I would have seconded it. Consid considering for discussion. So I, I make the motion for the purposes of discussion. Okay. Right. For the purposes of discussion, I like that because acting that way, I think, protects us legally and also is, I think it's the right thing to do because if we can think of a way to get, you know, more candidates, more candidates to fill all the positions, <laughs> I think that's, useful. It's, it, you know, they're not just out there lying on the ground. No. It's hard I to get people to work. I think it's getting to get a I would be agreeable to that if we could do a special meeting in 10 days to settle this. Thank you. I, thank you. Just, I think that, that, that might require a little more coordination with yeah. staff, so Type us into mailing out. Brian's going to leave. No, it's not going to be a mailing. You just kind of post it. I don't know if a mailing to Lompico. Yeah. I think yeah. using these folks to get the word out is going to be a lot. Well, and also, you know, 
10 days from the time of posting. So, so. Yeah, it's same 10 days. Or we need to coordinate with, um, I think, our district staff. 10 days. I, I'd like it from the perspective staff who can do this in a reasonable manner, in a reasonably timely manner. Okay, I, I very much like reaching out to, and as, as much as I appreciate the people being here tonight, I do too. I, um, do not necessarily, there's a silent, okay, uh, super majority out there that has not weighed in, and I want to know that they know about this, and that they um, have some knowledge of the change in, you know, some knowledge of the grand jury response, and that there's going to be, okay, a difference in, in the way they do this. Okay. And, so, ten, and 10 days may not be a sufficient period of time for that level of outreach, so... Again, my suggestion is to bring this back in next. September, the regularly scheduled board meeting in September, with it, after having done outreach to the community. Yeah, and then you come back in. Because they don't want it. Call for a vote. Okay. Um, any other? Okay. I don't want to think about this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And just um, one last comment. Yes. Tony, I appreciate your persistence. You're a survivor. Thank you for um, well, still I, being It's there. my responsibility. Yeah. I talked them into the merger. So. And thank but you for bringing something that. Um, oh yeah. Okay. I'm sure I was I mean, yeah. that. It, it was the right thing to do. Regardless. There's a pause back of, of, here. Um, I know we finished up. The communication. So anyway, um, are we ready to vote? Point of order. Well, yeah, um, well, I'm sorry. Does this include the I'm mailing sorry, I'm to, sorry, does this motion include the mailing to the Pico community that was discussed earlier? No. I'm not sure. Um, no. Can you state your okay? The motion I am now restating yep. um, that was for discussion purposes is that in light of the miscommunications about the number of appointments, the number of openings that was posted that were posted both in the agenda and the Facebook page due to those inconsistencies and to ensure full compliance with the Maddie Act and its time time frames and to ensure for adequate outreach to the Long Pico community that this item be carried over and redone in the September regular board meeting after full outreach to the Long Pico community through appropriate channels has been done. What is full outreach and appropriate channels? Uh, to be determined by staff, and that my motion is not further detailed. Okay. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, could we have a vote? Mm -hmm. Director Smallman? Aye. Director Hayes? Aye. Director Ratcliffe? Aye. Director Bruce? Yes. Chair Boston? Yes. Okay. That was different. So um, let's move on to item 10 a uh, board contract for design services of Long Pico Tax. <coughs> thank you, thank you all. This agenda item is pretty straightforward. Earlier this year, the district issued a request for qualifications with the intention of selecting three firms to serve as on call as needed engineering services for the district. The district staff went through a review process. Chair Bachman was included in that process and selected three firms. Those three firms have been reviewed by staff, and one firm was chosen to do the design services based on their prior work with tanks and tank sites, not only at this district, but with other districts as well. And the staff asked Sheik and Willer for a proposal to do design services for the three tank sites mentioned in the Long Pico Assessment District, uh, Assessment District 16-1. In discussions with Chuck and Willer, we have tried to come up with the most expeditious process while also recognizing economy of scale. So Chuck and Wheeler's proposal includes design services for all three tanks with the intention of bidding all three tanks to hopefully encourage bidders to actually provide good, decent numbers for construction of these tanks. The actual construction of the tanks would likely need to be staggered out over a number of years. Um, working on one tank site at a time might actually cause that to happen given the rain events of this district as well. So you're probably looking at at least a year-long process for design and permitting services and then one tank each year thereafter for construction purposes as a minimum. But tonight we are looking at awarding a contract for design services to Schaff and Mueller for the not to exceed amount of $124,700 on a time and material basis. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then go forward. Um, okay. 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 Any questions? 
this is pretty standard stuff. Good to me, but, yeah. 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 I don't have any comments for it. Okay, go to the public then first. Um, Ed, you have, okay. Uh, I'm going to let her go first because she may be covering what I was going to cover. And she's is it, better speaking. Is it Deborah? Than okay, Deborah yeah. then. So, this is great. It's going to be wonderful that we have done. The total contract is 1.47. The uh, estimate in the engineer's report for the one people assessment district is 73,125, but there's a contingency factor in their case that went up of 48,000, so that's 121,875, so you are over budget. Good news is, and this is why it's really good to have somebody with experience on this LADAC committee, <laughs> that um, there was, has already been a tank evaluation done. It's a lightweight tank evaluation done by MCD Miller Engineering. That might help smooth the way. It was required by San Lorenzo Valley Water District as a contingency upon doing the merger and, and setting up the prices that Lompico pay for an evaluation of what tanks should be there, whether they should be replaced with two or one. So there is a report in C.D. Miller, you use them. You are entitled to that report that since you bought, you are now owners of Lompico, is no longer proprietary. In addition, um, I can't read under this slide. There's a 13,000 <coughs> some for <coughs> geotechnical work that's included in this bid. Uh, I believe about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars was spent by Lampico, uh, Lampico Water again as a requirement by SLV. And maybe Rick, you remember this? Um, Carl Kasunik already did core sampling, soil evaluations, and there is a report on that. So that portion may not be required anymore. That was only several years ago, and I don't think Earth changes that much in this short amount of time. Where um, and Harl Kasunik is considered one of the top geotechnical firms in the Central Coast. So there is no question of whether that would be an adequate report. So I just suggest you go and try to find it. Carl Kasunik will have that on file if you can't find yours. And again, it's not proprietary since now you, Lompico is part of SLB. So that might save some money and get you down below budget. But again, it's really important to have this kind of information go through LADOC. Reviewing, we're not going to tell you what projects to do, but we would love to be able to see bids and look at this because there's quite a lot of people that really remember some of this work was done. And these two points were required by SLV as part of the merger. And I remember, <laughs> since I have a little bit of time left, on Citizens Advisory, this came up as a point of contention where people in Long Pico said, why would we spend so much money doing these two studies when we may not merge? And the answer was, it's information we'll be able to use on our own and we have to, if we have to do our own tank replacements. Uh, Mr. Fultz. Yeah, Bob Fultz, Boulder Creek. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow the process there. Did we get bids for this particular um, <coughs> work? Or did we sort of survey three firms and then pick one and then just got one price? I'm not, I'm not sure which way that went. Okay, taking note. Can we come back to this after we get all okay for appropriate staff comments? Okay, um, Ms. Norton. I just had a question. Um, I understood that the interconnection was going to be the first um, the priority project. Is that our, our already underway? Um, That's what I heard in the. I, I well, I heard it from. Um, <laughs> Okay, we'll come back to this. Okay, I'm, 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 the, the question about what the interconnect was. Yep. <coughs> That's um, water, sa fire safety issue. Um, anybody else? Mr. Ferris. Brian, did you say those, there's three tanks, correct? Or, I, I heard three tanks. Are those three tanks in a tank farm arrangement, or are they spread out over a large area? Okay. Noted. Noted. It might be the last, so we'll be quick. Three separate areas. That's an easy answer. Um, okay, any other oral comments or questions at this point? Okay, I don't see those. Okay, um, so we'll close out orals on this and come back here. Um, so for consulting services, we don't take bids. We take proposals or qualifications, and both are, both are acceptable. 
In this case, we took qualifications, and the district had ranked those qualifications and selected three firms to do design work for the district on an on-call as-needed basis. Of those three firms, Staff Review Shop and Wheeler determined that they were the most qualified to do the design for the tanks of this of these three sites. There are three sites, but there's more than three tanks. So there's three different sites, but there are there are more than three tanks. I think there's five. Mm -hmm. there's yes, five. five. There's so, two and one right now. <coughs> and then the, the sixth tank is one that's from another location. Is this a large area that these three sites Yeah, are? it's separate areas spread out through the camp. And, and that's one of the reasons why we're looking at economy of scale by possibly getting these three tanks at the same time. So getting to each site, I think only really one of the sites is relatively easy to get to, and that is a Right. And, and, and that's Sand Park. And that's in Sand Park. Yeah. The other two are a little bit more difficult to get to, so we're hoping to encourage bidders on the three of them to. It's quite a drive to get them to run. It, it okay. is definitely. Well, the Drone and Cast are both very narrow roads and right. tough for construction. But right. Dual, but tough. Right. Correct. And the, the, the question regarding the inter interconnect pi priority, prioritizing the interconnection versus prioritizing other projects. The tank construction is a higher priority. The state is pushing harder on the tank constructions, particularly for a couple of the sites. And with the tank construction comes increased fire storage in the facility, in the area. And that increased fire storage reduces the need to accelerate the interconnection so that we can spread these projects out as originally proposed over a 10-year period, page go plan so that we don't bring this assessment district into the red and that we maintain proper cash flow. And so staff has presented a number of proposed um, Gantt charts for the projects and the interconnection, I believe, on almost all of them has always been kind of out geared because we're going to get the tanks done for the fire protection. Uh, and if I can add to one part, part to this, um, I took Chapman Wheeler's um, consultants, their geotech consultants and their structural consultants out in the field and supply them with the reports that we had done before the consolidation. Um, they were preliminary uh, geotech reports uh, and that information was figured in and supplied to um, Chap and Wheeler as part of this proposal. Okay, great. Um, this was that, was, that was my concern because it, it, you know, thanks for bringing that information, Debbie, but um, I, I want to make sure that they were provided all that information. Is that you're talking? That was about thirty. That's an easy thirty thousand dollars for for all for all the tank sites, and we also yeah, had the soil stuff and all that. And I want to make survey. sure that, you know, we get the survey done. And then the and anyway, locations. yeah, I think Chef Willie looks good, but I just want to make sure that what Debbie was saying yeah, that all, all in our hands and it's not re being reduplicated. <laughs> it is not. Okay, it's being added too because. They were very preliminary reports. Yeah. Because we didn't spend. Yeah, know, they got to do it. It was to make sure we could put a tank back in that location. Okay. The survey was done to make sure that Lumpico owned the property where the tanks were. Okay. Um, and then that they were seismically uh, and geotechnically, we could put a tank back. Okay. Um, so we didn't have to find additional property. And all that information was passed on to Shop and Wheeler um, as part of preparing this preliminary. Very good. Okay. Okay, I, um, at Madrone and Caskey, there's two 60,000 gallon tanks that each of those is being replaced with a single 125. Is that hasn't been determined yet. Oh, okay. And the next sentence talks about that. Right. We're, we'll have to sit down with Shaf and Wheeler and look at, at, at the size of the two tanks. And uh, I, we don't believe, we're not sure one tank can fit on those parcels due to the topography or the two tank configuration needed because it's a small footprint. How about yeah. the Lewis tank? What's going to be down there? The Lewis tank will have, and we believe there's plenty of room. <coughs> it is Sam Parkland. Okay. And um, you just want one tank out of Well, we prefer, operational, we prefer two tanks. Because oh. you can take one offline and perform maintenance. Yeah. Um, we prefer that. Now, you're going to get into cost. Because two tanks are going to be a little bit more expensive than a single tank. But in the long run, when you go to do maintenance and uh, you know, paintings and coatings, you're going to spend a lot more on that. End. So there's there's a trade-off that has not been decided yet. How big is the Lewis tank? And the Lewis tank right now is 100,000 gallon, but we're going to bring the upper Lewis tank that has been taken offline. Uh, we're going to bring it down there for another 100,000. So it's around 240, I think, is what they're figuring out right now. Plus or minus. 
the upper the, ten. Yeah, these are rough numbers, don't, uh, you know, but yeah. this is what we have not uh, defined and what we will be doing as part of this process. Yeah. I heard a rumor that the, uh, so the, both the old, the tank, that, uh, the upper lowest tank is still... It has been removed. Uh, Lompico been, actually had it removed. It was failing, leaking, and I do believe... You say uh, you bring the tank down, you're not bringing the physical tank No, down. we're going to combine the two locations to one. Because I thought it was gone. gone. Well, it's it's, it's, it's wow. much higher in the distribution system. Yeah. There's no right. connections off of that higher zone. It's a pumping cost, additional pumping cost. We don't need to put it up there. The additional right. SCADA, this way here, we're putting them side by side on the same parcel. We can have one SCADA control. Um, Maintenance will be a lot easier, and we won't have to pump additional to get up to the upper. There are no connections off of the upper tank. But when I was actually asking, you know, replacing two sixty thousand with one twenty-five, it was not so much the, the the one versus two, but the capacity. So, the capacity at both of those sites is appropriate, I guess. The one hundred twenty-five. We believe so, but that'll be looked at. That'll be one of the steps. We believe so. <coughs> The state required that we either tear down the one Lewis tank or replace it. We didn't have the money to replace it. Okay. The fire flow calculations and storage will be run and be part of this final design. That's all included in the shopping wheel. Uh, shopping wheeler is very good uh, structural. And they're they're uh, also the structural on a probation tank. So. Uh, on that tank, mm -hmm. a very good um, design for the structure for a lot of tanks. No discussions. Okay. Um, any other board discussion? I just had a question actually for Dan that occurred to me. I was just looking at the CEQA permitting steps. They have consultation as 10 days. Is that realistic? Consultation with USFWS and California Department of Fish and they have a 10-day period. Do you think that's realistic? Especially the federal. It's not for the loose tank, though. It's not for the loose tank. It's for the other tank. I'll give you the tanks that aren't complicated. Okay. Because they well know that the loose tank is an environmental sensitive habitat. So I'm pretty sure that that's just for the other tanks. Okay. That would make sense. They've been looked at. It's a completely different type of soil. And hardwood can be. This is a case where having the mitigation zone set up but with the probation tank is going to really accelerate this project. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. We were all set up to, that's so great, that's an accelerated process. <laughs> okay, um, further discussion? Um, well, I'll make the recommendation to authorize the district manager to enter into a design services agreement for the design of the long people and replacements. Um, anticipated cost of 124700 in design services, which will be cost, um, that cost will be funded through assessment district 16-1. Did you clarify that was a motion? That was a motion. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, Director Smallman? Aye. Director Hayes? Aye. Director Ratcliffe? Aye. Director Bruce? Yes. Chair Bachman? Yes. That's my milestone in Lampico Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, item 10G, which is a selection of vice president to the board of directors. Um, and this recommendation is that I will re entertain nominations for the position of the board of vice president. And do I have any nomin nominations? Okay. I nominate Gene. Okay. Um, so we'll have one nomination at this point. Um, second. Okay, so we have a second. Um, any other thoughts? Okay. Um, any public comment on this? Hey, Mr. Holloway? Yeah, I think uh, Eric Hammer has done a great job this year as vice president. He has not chaired one meeting. He has not made one mistake. I think you should continue with Eric Hammer. Um, when ex-president Ratcliffe was president of the board last year, there were outrageous Brown Act violations. She went on the radio, she, she, she was so, cons so confused 
about the Terry Vieira case, that she just thought it would, she should just continue spending on Terry Vieira's behalf. And um, she's an example of everything that is wrong with the administration of this district. So if you think we're going to have a repeat, like we had a repeat, well, anyway, <laughs> I think it's a terrible idea. But go ahead and do it. Does anybody else like to come in? Um, I don't see any other public comment on this, so um, back here. Um, any other discussion? Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Could we um, vote. vote? Yeah. Director Smallman? Aye. Director Hayes? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Director Rockwood? Yes. Uh, Chair Bachman? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we're on to 10H, which is the 2018-30 second annual river and road cleanup. And the recommendation is that the Board of Directors review and file this memo and by motion of the Board for the use of district staff and equipment for the 2018 32nd Annual River and Road Cleanup to be held Saturday, September 15, 2018. Any other um, staff like to? Just this is a pretty exciting event for the Valley and I think it's a great participation and I encourage the Board to go for it. And it's been a long standing. We participated every year and called a lot of garbage over the years. <laughs> from the river. Enough where we need two people to help load. So it's been a very successful program. Okay. My kids have participated in it. I have as well for many, many years. And it's nice to haul weird stuff out of the roadsides and stream beds. And it's very satisfying. Okay. Um, any other comments? Any public comment on this? Come to my house if you want. Do you live on the river? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, good for you. What, what's the cost of this uh, from our standpoint? 600 bucks. I think that's. The county pays for the, the dump fee, disposal fee. Yeah. And so it's just uh, a truck. We just have the two, two staff people in that in small one. Okay. Cool. For about six hours. Yeah. They get overtime. They get overtime. Great. I think we should be doing right by the river. Yeah. So, to the degree that we can for a, in a simple and clear cut manner. Mm -hmm. so. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, um, motion? Okay. okay. I would love to move approval of our continued support for the 32nd Annual River and Road Cleanup to staff participation to support the work of the I'll second. Okay. Okay. Dr. Smallman? Aye. Dr. Hayes? Aye. Dr. Ratcliffe? Yes. Dr. Bruce? Mm -hmm. Yes. Chair Bachman? Yes. Okay. For the last mm -hmm. item, uh, okay. new business here. Um, we have an appointment of an interim district manager. So, um, we have had, um, okay, expressed interest from one internal person, okay, um, Mr. Rogers, and a couple of external. Um, I think we should just have a dis short discussion about, there's a consequence <coughs> if it's, uh, if we point at uh, the, the outside, um, okay, possibilities include, um, well, I don't know. Okay, is this appropriate? Okay, maybe I'm going into. Okay, and uh, let's. We should consider the in internal first. And if I could bring it up even just a little level, I will. So the board basically, the board kind of has two options. You can select an internal candidate for the appointment, or you can talk discuss about going externally. If you go externally, it is recommended that you develop a RFP process and advertise for it that has time constraints with it, obviously. So if staff is not recommending you go down that path, we have had interest expressed, but we haven't actually physically advertised for it. And so we really should do an RFP process if we're going to go external. If we go internal, we have three candidates. We have Jen Nicholson, we have Stephanie Hill, we have Rick Rogers. Um, given that Stephanie's not here tonight to defend herself, <laughs> consider that. But 
Realistically and logically, Rick Rogers is the appropriate appointment. I, I, on staff recommends Rick Rogers be appointed as interim uh, district manager, and I would ask the board to authorize Rick and me to work at a time schedule that is appropriate when I can hand off the reins to Rick and he can take the job full time. That would be sometime in September, more than likely. Um, just me a little left, and uh, my first thought was, I wonder if we could talk him into this. So um, <laughs> I'm very excited by the possibility that he would take this responsibility on. Uh, while while um, Rick was acting as the interim, I, was, I had the pleasure of being the board president. And I must say it was such a pleasure to work with Rick, who is um, always accessible to the board president and comes with so much history and knowledge and skill regarding the administration and operation of the district. So we are in incredibly good hands with with Rick Rogers, isn't um, Oh, yeah, I mean, I, that, that's what all I've been told. But uh, we are um, embarking on a, a lot of work going on here, but um, we have a very powerful candidate that could possibly come. So I, I, I think that this should be postponed um, until we evaluate the availability of Mr. Priestley fill this position um, uh, because I think it, he almost, um, you know, having somebody like that could be very valuable, but, you know, it, we do, I know if we do a co-op with somebody outside, we need to, um, like you said, <coughs> and then find out what kind of, you know, what kind of money he's looking for mm -hmm. to uh, compensate, but he was only interested in the interim um, position, but you're talking about somebody that's got, you know, a wealth of experience um, that, you know, really could, you know, help us out at this point. Otherwise, uh, you know, I think Rick would be fine, but um, I think we should, next meeting, we should evaluate um, Mr. Craig Priestley's uh, resume and have an open public meeting for the, the public to you've uh, evaluated as well. Um, yes, okay. And, and with, with all due respect to the o open casting a wider net, um, the process for that is many months of noticing and interviewing and um, there are elections happening, there are other projects happening that, that we have to be mindful of in our, in our process here at the district. I would, I would rather not skip a beat. I would rather not have a helmless district or a hamstrung interim interim. <coughs> so. Oh, well, I, absolutely. I mean, we have to follow the procedures. Right, but that, we, that, we, that we procedure takes in, months. In, in, interim right now, yeah. I, you know, I would have no problem. And, and, and I'd rather, if we go through a multi-month recruitment and outreach process, I'd rather that be for a permanent, a permanent. A permanent. Mm -hmm. you know? and maybe Mr. Price would be interested in a, uh, a reprise career. I thought he was. <laughs> no, he was retired. He was going to go know. move up to Reading or something. Yeah. Like that. So I, I, if, if we're going to invest the time so and effort I, I, I to outreach, I'd rather do it for the, the real deal. So yeah, I totally agree with that, and we're lucky to have Rick. And yeah. The only the only thing I would we don't want to wear you out, Rick. Okay. <laughs> You're wearing a lot of hats well, right now. Do you, you feel comfortable you know, taking that on? We've got a. You don't mind know, me interrupting that, Chuck? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, 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 we have an excellent management team. <coughs> right now. Yeah. When, when Jim Mueller left the district, Stephanie, um, uh, Holly, and, and Jen were. Or, you know, Jen was here for a little longer, but Stephanie and Holly were, were brand new. Yeah. Um, we have a, a, a real good management team in play now that are, are comfortable with their jobs. We have a good engineer and support team in play. You've seen Kirsten and I just uh, put a contract out with Shop and Wheeler, MEE, it's got the probation tank. We've got a host of engineers working. Yeah. Um, Mr. Presley is impeccable and, and would have the credentials. It's very yeah. highly. 
But if we have to go through a whole process, to but get an award I don't believe the management team wants totally to spend the next three to six months trying to get him up to speed right. and try to get a new manager and then do it again. And then do it again. I'm not into that. No, I'm, not. <laughs> I'm not into taking my time yeah. and bringing somebody, to training, to somebody to training someone for six months and barely getting them up to speed on a project. Yeah. Our projects are complicated. Um, can't say Mr. Presley wouldn't catch on very quickly. But Brian and I had a, a brief, very brief discussion about there are some projects out there that if he would be interested, that his expertise could be used as a consultant. Uh, well, uh, for instance, you know what I'm saying, the lion yeah. slide. It's a FEMA project. It's a landslide. It's a it's a roadway. It is right up his alley. Yeah. And I to help you out. And I would I would welcome his active. support. To take the, the lead on that project. Yes. I'm not sure he's interested in that. You know, he just retired yeah. from a, from a PERS, PERS agency. Um, not sure, but an intern manager from the outside would just be a headache for the management team to bring up to speed, and then start all over again. Yeah. You know, these projects are going to be seamless. We're not going to miss a beat on one Pico. We're not going to miss a beat on the CIP. We're going to move full speed ahead. The team's in play. You know, Brian has set that team up. He's got the money. Tell when Stephanie's working on bridge loans and so forth. Yep. It's in play. So, you know, not to chew my own horn, but I believe I am the best qualified for the intern manager. And if I get into trouble, I'll come see you guys. You know, I'm not going to just sit back. But we've got a great management team. James will step up and do my duties uh, as uh, he's deputy director of operations now. He'll step up acting director of operations. He'll take the field. We did this exact same thing before. Yeah. We went through, Margaret and I and the ad hoc committee went through a grand jury. We went through an election. We went through hiring a new manager. It's almost like day job. Yes. <laughs> um, and we did, uh, we, uh, we had a good run. Um, that's my two cents. I love us. I like to not nominate Rick. With the caveat that we do you know, perhaps have some discussion with Mr. Priestley to see if he can maybe fit in. You know, not to. I, I see. I see. I understand what you're saying. That to jump in as being the district manager would be kind of weird for him, especially because he was the direct, you know, director of public yeah. work. Yeah, he, he, and I, I, you know, I think I think you could fit a, some sort of role that he sort of works. And, and not to take anything away from him, but he held a, an extremely high position with the county, yeah. and. Our managers and department department heads are workers. We're, we don't have staffs to delegate, so we need someone who sits in that seat that works too. Bill, get delegate. over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, and he was a delegate. Um, he had staff to delegate. We need a manager that works as well as delegates. I mean, our, we don't have that kind of staff. Um, I agree. I, it, as chair of the board, I've had some more conversations with Rick a few than I um, did in previous years. I have complete confidence that Rick will be able to do what he did for the yeah. district and you again that same role, okay, um, something like four years ago. So um, I'm, you know, that's a great idea. Yeah, no, no, I, and uh, when we get back, somebody needs to make a motion rather than maybe a nomination or something. Yeah, okay, I think the language is important. But let me go out to the audience for, sure. to the some explanation of Mr. Priestley will be warranted as well. Uh, oh, of his, oh, you mean of his role in that? I right. think, yeah. Well, let me, let me get orals and then we can discuss this before we finalize something. Uh, Mr. Holloway had his hand up for the talk of a but I agree with the district council. I don't even know what you're talking about here. Uh, somebody named Priestley or Presley, I don't know who this is that you're talking about. So I think we should know. Uh, and if there's some written communication, I think we should know it right now. Uh, this is what goes on in local government boards. They pass around information among themselves and the public doesn't even know. It's not in the packet. Nobody knows what you're talking about. <coughs> so who is this Presley, Presley person? Chair Paul, could I come? Well, why don't we get oral? Oh, yeah. Go through oral oh, okay. Come so no problem. We'll no we'll problem. No, no, if there's nothing in writing, because if there's anything in writing that has been presented to the board, with the name of Priestley or Presley or whatever it is, then we should be seeing it right now. Uh, we shouldn't have to submit a records request or anything. We should know what the heck you're talking about. Um, looking at the clock. 
It's almost 10 o'clock. This is the hour when Brian Seeley was hired. Brian Seeley was hired the evening before three board members' terms expired. He's Terry Beer's hireling. He was hired here, job one. Job one is to defend Terry Beer, defend board members, defend Terry Beer, and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um, I would suggest that you not repeat the same mistake that was made four years ago when you hired Brian C. Lee. It is deja vu all over again. Four years ago, there was a grand jury report. Four years ago, the district manager resigned. Four years ago, the outgoing board hired a new district manager in the dark of night at 10 o'clock at night. Now, this district manager. Okay, Gina, I'd like to, and just pause here a second. Um, we're talking about the district manager hiring. What is on our agenda tonight is the. Who's Presley? Of, of it. Who's Presley? Um, when they finish that oral communication, there, we'll see what we say about that. I'll, Address. I will consider your concerns at that point. Um, <coughs> we're considering tonight the appointment of an interim district manager. I'm asking the board to, to give a warning that the comments are not germane to the topic. If that's what you wish to do. I'm asking the board not to repeat the mistakes of the past, and the mistakes of the past are very glaring. So, um, I, what, uh, no, no, please don't interrupt me anymore. Um, you, you, you know, you put limitations on members of the public. And then you go on and you talk, we're here at 10 o'clock at night. What time did the meeting start? Didn't the meeting start at 5 o'clock? You've been here for five hours. And you okay. want to interrupt me before I go no. through my okay. three minutes. No, no, you want to interrupt me. I'm, no, 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 you no. want to interrupt me. You're not willing to see, you're not willing to see even three minutes for someone else. On topic of the appointment of interim district manager, you're off topic. Shut up. Um, is this disruptive this speech? repeatedly... Uh, I want my time. Speech. Please stop disrupting. Okay. You stop interrupting me. Um, stop interrupting me, and I will complete my uh, three minutes. Chair Balkan, I recommend giving the speaker uh, resetting the timer, giving the speaker one chance to speak germane to the topic for three minutes, and then going through the warning sequence if disruptive behavior continues. Okay. Um, so start the clock. Start the clock um, at this point and. Uh, address the item on the agenda. I observed that uh, District. Uh, I observed that Rick Rogers already restarted the clock when you interrupted me, President Buckman. And the topic is interim district manager, and I am asking that you not repeat the mistakes of four years ago, and that you not appoint an interim district manager. And. If you think you're going to, I think you should make it public, whoever Priestley or Presley is, that apparently you've already been talking about. So I think you should appoint Rick Rogers, permanent district manager, not interim whatsoever. We've already been over this four years ago. I believe that Rick has the respect and admiration of the staff. I don't think he's a perfect candidate, but I think that's quite a bit in his favor. And uh, I wish to God we had done this four years ago. And I would like to know from Rick, once he has taken the reins, I'd like to know what process he thinks this district ought to follow to figure out who should be the next district manager after him. I have no idea how long he expects to stay here. But one advantage that I see of promoting Rick is that there's a whole chain of people below him that will also get promoted. Um, so that's really my recommendation. I don't know why it's necessary for this board to interrupt me repeatedly when I'm here to address the exact item that's on the agenda about interim district manager. And um, I can't say how grateful I am that Brian C. Lee is leaving town, and I just wish that he would get in the car and start it up and go away and never come back. Here, here. Um, Lois. Well, I wholeheartedly support Rick Rogers. He was great in 2014. 
I think he'd be good again. Right? Right. He's, he's, uh, he's so well-spoken and he's so kind. And he's, e he's just easy to talk to. Uh, so, and I, I actually sent Nancy Mason an email and asked her to come tonight because I knew there was something on the, on the agenda. I thought she might be here and I said, please come and support Rick Rogers. And she, of course, does support Rick Rogers. Thank you. Sorry, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mean to rave about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I also believe that I, I have to say that I agree with Bruce. I think forget about any, any other new district manager. If Rick was willing to take the job permanently, I think that would be great for the, the Valley. <laughs> and um, and he, he's honest. He is knowledgeable. He is well-spoken. That I, I believe that the entire community has so much respect for him. When he goes to our meetings, everybody is quiet when he speaks because we all know that what comes out of his mouth is relevant and um, is important to us. So I, I certainly wish, you know, I don't know if he would, but you'd be really lucky if he'd accept the permanent position. Um, well, okay, we got public. Um, Mr. Schwann. Swan. Steve Swan from Ben Lowen. I also wanted to join in and encourage the uh, appointment of Rick Rogers to serve out the uh, remainder of the term. And anything <laughs> beyond that I think is you know, up for additional debate and discussion. But I would also encourage, as everyone else is, to the board to not appoint anybody else prior to the end of the, uh, the term of uh, the new election that will take place. So let's leave any new selections until 2019. Okay, I'll come back to that thought. Okay, Ms. Um, Lohan. Since we're roasting Rick. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a roast. This is, not a <laughs> it, is it is absolutely, it is absolutely a roast, and I fully support Mr. Rogers for the interim manager, and if he's willing to stretch that interim to several years, I'd be very, very happy to. Um, one of the reasons is because we have worked with him both in our road association and um, with some pipeline work, and also the inner side. And he knows how to work with people. He knows the importance of working with the community and being open. And, he, and we imposed all kinds of requirements and notifications, and he said, and he was on it every time, because I know in my neighborhood it's important to people to know when the road's going to be closed and when it's going to be open, when we're going to be out of water. And he didn't flinch. He gave us daily updates. And he was amazing. And Mr. Lee, I wish you all the best. And I hope you find what you're looking for. I think that you are not a good fit for this district. We have a sort of, we have a Northern California mentality and we do things a lot different than I think where you're from. And I think that was the cause of a lot of struggles here. And I really do hope you find what you're looking for. Thank you. Um. Ed had his hand up. I'm going to uh, I want to voice my not disapproval, but approval of Rick for the interim manager. And I would say <coughs> if he would take the permanent, would be much more appropriate. We, I worked with him on this uh, interconnect and the road association because I was the manager at that time. And I have to say is he has the one quality that is very important to the people that I work with, and that's trust. <coughs> if he says something, he backs it up. He doesn't waver, and he tells you the way it is. But you can trust this man. I wholeheartedly think he should be the permanent manager if he would accept it. Thank you. Mr. Gold. <laughs> so there, there, there's an old joke uh, that says, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And I think it's, it's worth sort of reflecting on, you know, we're here again appointing a, a new interim district manager, which, by the way, absolutely needs to be Mr. Rogers. 
Um, but the circumstances, grand jury issues, all the, uh, we get resign, uh, resignations. And Rick, I do hope that you take uh, or that you want to throw your hat in the ring for the permanent position. But I would only say make sure your contract goes a little further than four years just to make sure you get through the next three-person election if, the, if you decide to do that. But I, I think the board should do that tonight, and uh, let's move on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, let me see if we have any other public comment. Uh, anybody else want, from the public want to comment on this item? Um, seeing none, um, we'll come back to the board. Uh, uh, I just wanted to clarify that uh, Mr. Kirk Priestley is the director of the public works for the county, and he said correspondence. He's retired, right? Retired. After the agenda was posted. So I don't, I mean, I don't think it's out of line to mention that because it's sort of pertinent of what we're talking about tonight. And the only thing that we can do tonight, we can't make Rick permanent. We can, we can <laughs> make him in, interim at, at this meeting. <laughs> so I would like to make a motion to nominate Rick Rogers as the interim district manager for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Second. Okay. Third. <laughs> <laughs> Just on behalf of staff, I would also we support Rick. <laughs> Did you speak for Stephanie? I think so. Okay. Um, but we are going to share the heck out of her on Monday morning. <laughs> um, so, considering that we are considering only internal candidates, is there any need to address um, other outside? Is there anything to clean up? Okay. Um, no. One clarification may be warranted, but there was an email sent to the board, as you said, after the agenda was posted. It consisted primarily of a resume, and therefore I recommended that it be treated as confidential and not be handed out to the public at the meeting. Because it's not clear whether the intent of the person was to have it be confidential or have it be public. But, um, did you go to the board? It did. I, the question. I, and, I'd rather small on you. I didn't get the resume. I got. I just got some emails. Yeah, but you got an email, and I know I discussed it with Chuck. But the email went to bodsrww.com. I'm not aware that three other board members actually received it. But staff, to my knowledge, did not distribute it out. I didn't get the resume. I got the message. Just, just got a, a one paragraph message. That was it. That was all I got. I did yeah. not get a resume. No resume. I, I checked it out myself. Yeah. Just from available public information. Okay. Um, but it was just, I felt that he's a, had some talent there that okay. <laughs> I'd like to yeah, tap in it somehow, but you know, after. Maybe possible. Yeah, yeah. still do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have a motion. You seconded. Um, and no other board discussion, so let's vote. Director Hayes? Uh, yes. Director Atla? Yes. Uh, Director Bruce? Yes. Director Smallman? Yes. Chair Baldwin? Yes. I just want to thank you all for all your time where you kind of laid it on kind of thick. <laughs> I appreciate the support. I could have done more. <laughs> hey, Rick, we'll roast you more next time. Uh, there we go. Give it to you. <laughs> but thank you. It was an interim roast. This guy said it was an interim roast. I wanted to ask that in our, in our capital improvement plan that we actually prospect for the fountain of youth and that's a so that we can ensure that Rick is immortal for all that we have. Yeah, really. He looks so young. I know. Yeah. Remember, I have 42 years here. Wow. He started when he was yeah. 10. I know, right? That's the answer to the meeting. Don't look a day is. over 40. There it is. That's the answer to the universe, like the universe and everything. But I'm wondering if, um, if I could take just a couple moments to sh just to say that the executive recruitment process is a lengthy one. And um, we can probably talk about this in the future, but we should, be a we should, future. We should plan it forward and not rush to it. Correct. I agree. And I thought that was sort of confusing that it's not it's sort of an executive recruitment, but for, for an interim position, not a permanent. I don't know how that. Works. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. You would be better. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to um, the consent agenda. Um, consent agenda has um, okay, the minutes from two board meetings. Um, so, um, would any? I would move approval of the two items on the consent agenda, item 11A and 11B. 11A, 11A. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to go to the public um, comment on the consent agenda. I don't see any um, by raising my hand, so yeah. three minutes. Mm -hmm. Bring it back to the board for, and nobody's uh, I saw no errors around. Okay, so yeah. call for a vote on the consent agenda. Okay. Uh, Director Smallman? Aye. Director Hayes? Aye. Director Ratcliffe? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Chair Bachman? Yes. Okay, and we have, are getting close. Um, District reports. Um, I'm getting a little bit late. Um, I'll offer staff an opportunity to get anything, but will not insist upon a okay, elaboration. I just, I just have one item that I'd like to comment on, which is the budget finance committee meeting that we held at Bear Creek Estates. Okay. And that was a very positive meeting. And Stephanie's going to be working with um, volunteers of the Bear Creek Estates <coughs> wastewater system to develop a final game plan. And all indications are that staff will be recommending a 218 process start in September for rate approval, rate increase approvals. It looks like it looks like we had consensus, uh, but for a few loose areas. So I think that was a very positive meeting, and I'm moving forward in that regard. So, and then the, the final thing I'd like to say is I want to thank you. Um, it has been a pleasure working for you, and I'm taking away a lot of great memories and, um, and a lot of great friendships. For that, thank you. Thank you, Okay. Um, any public uh, comment on anything in the district reports? Oh. I just have a question on page 150. There's an employee reimbursement to Holly Hossack for over $500. It says it's for board ampersand. What is that? Did you get a bunch of sandwiches or something? What, what, what did Holly get reimbursed five hundred dollars for the board ampersand for? Okay, um, I'll take any other public comment before we. Uh... Typical, no, no, no response at all. Nobody up there knows. Um, Just vote. Is there any other public comment on this item? Okay, I see none. Um, <coughs> What's the answer? Do we have a? Okay. Uh, were there any other comments? I, no, there weren't no other okay, comments. Okay, if there were no other comments, we host employee recognition meals quarterly, and Holly fronted the money for this particular employee recognition meal, and the district is reimbursing it. Okay. Who was the employee that got recognized? It's several. It's a quarterly, or they recognize like all employee employees. Of the month? It's all employees, but the ones that have anniversaries in that quarter get recognized. I think I was there for your 40. <laughs> and it's well attended. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's a, a good function. It, it brings the staff together. It's one of the few times they all get together and they can spend an hour because they work all different kinds of shit. It's good for work. We're at a long shower. Yeah, and it's on a long shower. <laughs> In this one. <laughs> <laughs> there may be some scraps there. Um, any other? Any other public comment from um, district reports? None. And um, any other board comments? I, I uh, just because this is an area of personal interest, um, Rick shared uh, that he met with PG&E and he met with other water district leaders and fire department leaders, I believe, right? Correct. So the and recent... Thank you. Recently, the um, investor-owned utilities have been directed to mitigate fire hazard, and one of the ways they are doing that is to proactively de-energize distribution lines in the event of what are called red flag days, so it's really hot and dry and windy, and there's a 
high likelihood that if there were a fire, it would be a, a horrible problem. So by de-energizing the lines, they reduce the risk that lines might swing and bar or otherwise create a fire hazard. What that means for water districts and public health facilities is that we could, without very much notice at all, or no notice, be without power. And their new requirements are that they have to physically check the lines before they re-energize them. So it could be many hours or many days before they actually turn the power back on. <coughs> so Rick is, I want to acknowledge his leadership for convening all of the other water districts and fire departments to bring together a conversation with PGD, who um, they, they need to do a better job of communicating with us about when they're going to turn the power on. Yeah, there were, oh, just a comment on that. There was a, uh, Kevin Collins wrote an uh, article that I didn't really know about. There's a, a, actually technology. Closers and reclosers well, on basically the lines. The, um, when the lines hit the ground, it you know, turns the power off. Right. There's, there's it actually tests it three times. Or something. They but see, they, they deactivated all of those. This is one of the problems. They deactivated uh, all of those because those testing the line when the lines were down cause arcs and sparks and fires. Yeah. So that's what takes, as uh, Margaret was saying, they have to physically go out and check all the lines and it's going to take up to seven days that we can be out of power where they physically fly them, helicopter fly them, drive them, walk them. They no longer will use the automatics yeah. in the field. But I can see it. I mean, you're right. I mean, it's going to be yeah. a major headache. But, and just think of all the people that have home offices and stuff. You know, worse, than, worse than that, yeah. in Contra Costa County a couple of weeks ago, there was a red flag day circumstance. They de-energized a zone, and then there was a fire. And the fire department rolled and had no water pressure. Well, well, I was asked a question recently about how, what the impact is on our system. In, if, there's an, if there's a voluntary turn off of power, okay, um, do our generators um, mm -hmm. you know, do everything they need to for some period of time? How long can we run at full capacity? Can we initially? Does it take a while? You know, are we not going to be able to pump, but we've got tanks that are working? Or, Most know. likely it will be during the summertime when our demand is at its maximum. In the old days, it was winter months when we our only source of supply was <coughs> using maybe the treatment plants. Consumption was way down, people weren't using water, we could sustain a long power outage. Mm -hmm. Middle of summer, like today, if we lost power within two to four hours, we'd start losing storage. We do not have generators for 100% of our facilities. Mm -hmm. We have three or four mobile generators that we move from the wells to the sources of supply. Our treatment plants have backup power. A handful of our booster pumps have stationary or standby power there. We're putting more in, but we do not have enough for all facilities. Parts of our district will come up with a loss of water and loss of storage and fire storage. We'll try to rotate generators, but in a summertime outage, and it's all the all the districts are that way. And Santa Cruz was voicing concerns that their generators that run their major pumps that they will need use 100 gallons of diesel fuel an hour and they have like a six hour fuel supply. And getting then they have to start hauling diesel in. And it's, it's gonna be a huge problem when it will happen, and it's not if, it's when. You know, pg and &E says that there's a likelihood it will happen in the near future. You know, they're, they're putting uh, global warming and change, the fire storms, the hurricanes, the different things that, uh, fire hurricanes that we're seeing. So everything's changing in firefighting and pg and &E response. We can have a prolonged outage up to seven days. And we could have as little notice as a couple hours. They say they're going to try to work on notice, and hopefully we'll know. But you're talking about a crippling event. And we are in a critical three area, San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Uh, we have the most pumps in the pg e Monterey area that are affected by this program. So we're going to have to start gearing up with more generators, which is more cost, more maintenance, more operational costs. So we will start each budget year adding to the, the fleet of generators and get more stationary generators. And there's other things happening. You know, Margaret's going to tell you about, um, you know, battery backups. Battery backups have come a long ways, and it's cell sites that charge batteries at sites. You know, that's coming a long ways. Power walls. Yeah. 
DGD is no stranger to make bad decisions. So. <laughs> well, 90% of what they're putting out is PR, I think, and 10% yeah. is it's insurance liability. Yeah. yeah. But we've got to prepare. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Just two comments on the reports. Oh, sure. Water sales, the totals are in for all last year. Stephanie finally added them all up and to up slightly, like 10% more water sold this year than the previous year. <coughs> Most of that was in the front half of the year. Actually, it's been underneath last year. And uh, our liquid assets are about $3 million. Yes, first time in a little while. So that's definitely going back up the other direction now. That's good. Okay. Any other? Okay. Um, and give one last chance for public on. I think there's a loan payment due on September 1st, so if you're at $3 million, that's great, but that's going to be gone soon. Okay. Um, so we've got orals from the public, and um, we have no written communications. Um, there's informational material, any comments? Any comments on informational material? Um, seeing them from the public or from the board. Um, we will adjourn at almost precisely 10, well, 10.20 according to the Yes, 10.20. Oh, I got somebody corrected.